on chemical residues in food. The House Government Operations Subcommittee recently examined the federal government's programs to ensure that the nation's food supply is safe. We'll hear from food experts and government officials. Chairing the hearing is Congressman Adolphus Towns of New York. This event runs about two and a half hours. This subcommittee will come to order. Today, the subcommittee continues its review of the Vice President's proposal on reinvent federal food safety efforts. The subcommittee's hearings have revealed that USDA and FDA are not adequately protecting consumers from microbial contamination of food. The major cause of foodborne illness is the, in the United States. Today we will review the federal government's programs to ensure that the nation's food supply is not being poisoned with unsafe chemical residues and industrial and environmental contaminants. We will hear testimony from General Accounting Office on two reports prepared at the subcommittee's request. One report analyzes USDA's efforts to monitor chemical residues and contaminants in meat and poultry. The second report examines the overall federal structure and programs for monitoring chemical residues and contaminants in all food. We'll also hear from USDA, FDA, and EPA. Fear about unsafe pesticides, animal drugs, and environmental contaminants in our food, especially our children's food, such as dioxin and lead, continues to be one of the major public health issues of our time. The public expects to be protected from unsafe chemical residues and contaminants in their food. The question before this committee is, how well, how well is the federal government doing this? The answer is frightening. As GAO will testify, the federal government's existing approach for ensuring that the U U.S. food supply does not contain unsafe chemical residues and contaminants is fundamentally flawed. The existing screen is not only letting the gnats, it's letting in bulldozers. And the safety problem of imported food are even worse. The federal government simply cannot test much of the food supply for many of the residues and contaminants that are in our food because of limitations in technology, resources, and knowledge about what our food is exposed to. Even when the government tests and finds violations, contaminated food often reaches consumers before the test results are back from the lab. Even then, the federal government prosecutes only a minuscule number of violators. In short, the federal government's current approach chase problems after they occur. This is like closing the barn after the animal has escaped. It is ineffective and costly. It does not deter future violations. And most importantly, it does not prevent problems from occurring. That's why over 110 million boxes of cereal adulterated with an unapproved pesticide escaped detection by the federal government for over one year and reached millions of consumers. Fortunately, FDA and EPA have determined that there wasn't a safety problem and the company appears to have responded to this. However, it's pretty clear that the system is badly broken and needs to be fixed. The worst part about this situation is that the federal government has known for some time that its current approach is flawed. The officials testifying today inherited these defective programs. 
Our focus is not to lay blame today. Our focus is to seek solutions. We need solutions to these problems. The federal government needs a new approach to monitor and safe chemical residues and contaminants, contaminants in food. And we need it now. We cannot afford the luxury of waiting. At this time, I yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Schiff from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple things I'd like to say briefly. The first is to commend you on continuing this series of hearings which we have had on the uh, safety of the food supply to American consumers. Um, I believe that our first hearing was, uh, was on the E. coli bacteria contamination in meat. And I read just recently, uh, I believe in the East Coast, a recent breakout of E. coli uh, sicknesses, which shows that uh, we've picked a subject which is uh, uh, very current and very real and very much in need of, of congressional study. Second of all, I want to say that, that uh, the more I have studied this issue along with you, the more I am convinced that we do need, as the Congress, to centralize food safety inspection into one agency. I think one of the problems is, is that it is spread out, certainly in at least two different departments, and I think when you look at the whole list of, uh, of um, different players, we'll see that food safety responsibility actually extends into several federal departments. I'm convinced that we would be more effective in monitoring uh, the food supply uh, safety in this country if there was one single agency that was responsible for that task. Now the problem of course is identifying <coughs> which agency, if we were to use a current agency, should be given that responsibility or if we were to create a new agency, <coughs> where would that be placed in terms of federal responsibility? That remains a very real issue. But I think the policy of centering uh, food safety in one agency is, uh, is to me, a glaringly uh, important and, and something that we should make as our goal. I, I, would, I would take as an example the uh, uh, reference you made to a contamination of a, of a cereal. I believe I'm familiar with what happened in that situation. And uh, it should be pointed out that what actually happened <coughs> was a, a contractor uh, being used by a cereal producer uh, without authorization, in fact, uh, absolutely against the policy of the cereal manufacturer, used, uh, used a chemical that was never authorized, uh, should never have been used in the first place. Uh, and this was unknown to the cereal company, and they, they did everything possible to rectify it once they found out what happened. But the issue is not the cereal company. The issue is how long did it take the system to discover the fact that an individual uh, was, uh, was uh, contaminating uh, a particular cereal before it was discovered and before this particular batch was taken off of the market. That is the issue and I think that if there was one agency responsible for all federal food service inspections that uh, we would have seen a, a, a prompter detection of that problem. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Let me thank you too for your very thoughtful statement and uh I agree with you that safety is really the issue, and this is what we're dealing with this morning. At this time, I would like to call on uh, Mr. Harmon, Director of the Food and Agriculture Issues uh, from the GAO. And may I ask that you please um, uh, introduce um, staff members that might be and uh, providing testimony this morning? Any staff member that might be providing testimony, we introduce them? To? We're switching our name tags here. Okay. Uh, Let me, uh, uh, it is a custom of the Government Operations Committee to ask that all witnesses who testify before this committee are sworn in. Do you swear, raise your right hand, do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth shall up to God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I've now, let me just say also that uh, uh, we have your entire statement which will be included in the record and if you would just summarize within five minutes which will allow the committee an opportunity to raise certain some questions with you, we would appreciate it. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to introduce Ed Zajora who is with me this morning. He has uh, been responsible for our food safety work as an assistant director for the last five or six years. And we are pleased to participate in this uh, hearing which is a continuation as uh, you mentioned of uh, 
the subcommittee's efforts to improve the effectiveness of the federal food safety system. We have been for some time calling for fundamental changes to that system, particularly in its ability to protect uh, the food supply from microbial hazards. And today we will discuss the system's ability to protect against unsafe chemical residues and uh, environmental contaminants. And my comments, as you mentioned, are based on the two reports that, uh, that you uh, talked about in your opening comments. Now, first one regarding the uh, uh, National Residue Program. The uh, program has weaknesses in testing and sampling, as well as in the support it receives from other agencies. For example, FSIS, which is the agency that carries out that program, <coughs> cannot ensure that compounds presenting the greatest risk have been identified and are being tested for under the program. There are also flaws in the NRP sampling tech methodology which may bias uh, the results. And finally, because NRP uh, testi testing focuses on domestic compounds of concern, it is of limited value in determining whether import, the imported meat and poultry contains unapproved or banned uh, drugs or pesticides. As for the support FSIS receives from other agencies, EPA and FDA may not be able to provide the FSIS with the most current information on chemical risks and tolerances. Because of uh, limited resources, FDA investigated only about 20 percent of the over 21,000 residue violations referred to it by uh, FSIS from 1989 through 1992. Uh, the violations investigated about 9 percent and resulted in regulatory action against violators, mostly in the form of warning letters that carry no penalty, and there was one prosecution that resulted from these investigations. <coughs> the problems that we have identified with uh, this program are not uh, unique. They exemplify problems we and others have been uh, describing for the past two decades for many federal programs that monitor chemicals in domestic and imported, imported foods. While the federal agencies have taken steps to address criticisms, they cannot by themselves overcome five systemic and structural weaknesses that are responsible for the continuation of these problems. Because some of these weaknesses are the result of legislation and the basic design of the federal food safety system, Successful corrective actions will depend on congressional initiatives. And I'll just briefly talk about each one of the five weaknesses that we describe in the report. The first one, uh, the fragmentation of responsibility among the multiple agencies results in inefficiencies and gaps in federal monitoring activities. For example, among FDA, EPA, and USDA, there is often little agreement on the data that should be collected, the methods uh, for analyzing these data, and ultimately the results of the data analyzed. Consequently, the agencies may not reach the same conclusions on the level of risk posed by a particular chemical and the level of uh, needed regulation. And secondly, chemicals posing similar risks may be regulated differently under different laws. For example, we found that federal food safety laws have resulted in different standards for chemicals posing similar risks, do not generally require the agencies to regularly uh, reevaluate chemicals approved in the past against current scientific uh, standards and do not specifically address the critical risk posed by environmental contaminants in food. In addition, unapproved chemical use has become a routine practice as a result of federal regulation and policy that allow the use of unapproved pesticides and animal drugs to address emergency situations. Third, federal agencies rely on programs to detect unsafe chemicals in food rather than preventing these problems from developing. The basic federal approach to ensuring food safety, that is, in product testing, is on, not only resource intensive, but ultimately ineffective in preventing contamination from occurring. Newer approaches to ensure food, to ensure food safety, such as the hazard analysis and critical control point or HACCP approach, recognize these difficulties and seek to build safeguards into food production. Fourth, agencies like, lack uh, strong enforcement authorities to adequately deter or penalize violators. Uh, for example, FDA which is the primary enforcing agency for food violations, does not always act on violations referred by other agencies because of a lack of resources and other competing priorities. Moreover, FDA lacks uh, the authority to detain validated products and to assess uh, uh, civil penalties. Finally, uh, similar problems exist for imported foods where the United States has even less control. Weaknesses in the U.S. system uh, result in gaps in monitoring of imported food for several reasons. Uh, first, FDA's inspection resources could just cannot keep pace with the growing volume of imported food. Uh, secondly, some imported products may not be tested for compounds that are used in exporting, exporting countries but are not approved for use in the U.S. And third, as a result of the weaknesses in its regulatory authorities, FDA in some instances has not been able to prevent the distribution of contaminated imported products to U.S. consumers. 
Uh, we do make a number of uh, recommendations in the report. I guess there's two key ones in these reports. Uh, one has to do with uh, 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 moving the, uh, the process more to prevention as opposed to end product testing. And the other one has to do with, uh, with the creation of a single food safety agency, which we've been advocating for several years now. Uh, that completes my summary, Mr. Chairman. We'd be pleased to answer any questions that uh, you or uh, Mr. Schiff uh, may have. But thank you very much for your, your statement. And uh, let me also, um, uh, at this time, thank you for those two, what I consider, excellent reports. Uh, before I get to the specifics, let me uh, make certain that we understand the big picture. Can the federal government test for all the hazardous chemical residues and contaminants that may be in our food? No, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm afraid not, and that's part, of the, uh, that's part of the flaws in the system. There's just too many. If it finds a problem, can the federal government generally prevent the distribution of contaminated food if there's a problem? Not uh, as it exists right now, no. Can the federal government effectively penalize violators and deter future residue violations if they find them? No, Mr. Chairman, as, as we've said, we, uh, we're calling for some, uh, some improvements in that area, and, uh, and I believe the administration, uh, for the most part, agrees with us on the, on the need. Can the federal government effectively prevent residue and, and contamination problems from occurring, period? No. Is the current federal approach to monitoring chemical residues and contaminants in food fundamentally flawed? Yes, it is, and, and that's because of, uh, we just rely too heavily on in-product testing and not enough on prevention, basically. Mr. Harmon, what is the basis for GAO's finding? Well, it uh, involves some two decades worth of work has been done uh, by us and by others. Uh, we have brought up some of the uh, uh, work that uh, forms the basis of our, uh, of this, uh, these, t these particular products that were issued today, uh, released today, and uh, you can see it's quite a few. Now, we didn't bring them all because uh, I just uh, was afraid of uh, injuring my staff with uh, additional weight that had to be brought up, but uh, it is quite a bit of work, and uh, our work was based on that as well as updating uh, what had been done. Okay, on the basis of all of that work, and we're happy that you didn't uh, injure your staff, nah. <laughs> Is the existing federal approach to monitoring chemical residues and contaminants in food adequately protecting consumers? No, it's, it's not. And I, I don't mean to infer that, uh, that we have an unsafe, uh, unsafe food out there, but uh, given what uh, the laws are intending to do, it is not doing that. And uh, I'm afraid to say, as you pointed out in your opening statement, that uh, this system probably cannot do that. Uh, and because you just cannot do the end product testing that's needed to give the consumers the kind of assurance that they, uh, they're probably going to need to feel that the system is safe. Your report states that USDA's residue program is flawed. How many chemical compounds has USDA ranked as high priority for testing? There are 48. How many of these high priority compounds did USDA test for in 1992? Uh, about 24. Why didn't USDA test for the other 24 high priority compounds? Well, they didn't have uh, they didn't have methods for about uh, half of those or 12 of them, and the other uh, 12 uh, just simply were not tested uh, because of uh, other priorities or or uh, or uh, just lack of resources. Could you provide an example of a high priority compound uh, that USDA did not test for? I'm going to let uh, Ed answer that question. I think he probably uh, can give you more detailed information that, uh, than I may be able to. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, we can probably provide several. Uh, Furazolidone, uh, it's, it's uh, use has been uh, 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 removed by uh, FDA in this country, but it's still thought and believed to be in widespread worldwide use. Uh, clenbuterol, uh, there have been over a thousand significant uh, adverse reactions in Europe to, to this. It hasn't been tested for in 92 or 93. Uh, chloramphenicol is believed to be used in cultured shrimp, of which we import up to 140 million pounds a year. It was not tested for in 92 or 93. Um, would be three that I can think of. 
Okay. Are there any health concerns with the drug uh, for for ol for, for ozolodon, right? Furazolodone. For, for <laughs> yes. Uh, are there any cancer causing effects of that? It's believed to be a carcinogen. It's one of the reasons it was its uh, its use was uh, uh, taken away in this country, and there's no method to test for it. Will you submit for the record a list of the high priority compounds that USDA did not test for in 1992? Can we get a list of those for the record? Yes. Uh, your report uh, presents some alarming data on imported meat. Uh, let me just ask this question and I'll uh, yield for uh, Mr. Schiff to have a round. How much meat imported does the United States import? It's somewhere between 4 and 6 percent is, uh, of our uh, consumption is imported. All right. Your report states that USDA does not test imported meat for pesticides and animal drugs approved for use in foreign countries but not approved or banned in the United States. Can you provide some examples? I would primarily uh, start off with the three I just gave you, uh, uh, nitrofurazone, clenbuterol, chloramphenicol. Uh, there's also one called nitrofurazone, which is another animal drug that's used at least in some countries. Uh, a couple of years ago, USDA's Inspector General did a study and identified in just five countries, 175 unapproved animal drugs uh, that those countries weren't testing for and we weren't either. Um, and there's many other examples. Okay. I, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record documents obtained by the subcommittee from FDA which shows that nitrophone and particular uh, for, for Zoldodone and, uh, and also uh, uh, it actually, you put it in the record to uh, indicate the fact that uh, this material has been received. Uh, so we'd like to, if no objections, I'd like to include that in the record. Uh, your report, report states that USDA does not test imported meat for heavy metals, even though exporting countries have reported findings, high incidence of heavy metals in excess of their own document stand, domestic standards. Can you provide a specific example what countries and compounds are you talking about? Uh, sure, I can give you several of them. Uh, in, uh, at various points in time, in 1989, 90, 91, 92, and 93, New Zealand, for example, reported violations of between 3 and 100 percent of their test samples for cadmium, mercury, and zinc. Uh, Denmark in 1992 reported 11 percent for cadmium, lead, mercury, uh, chromium, nickel, selenium, um, Australia has reported in 1991 rates of up to 53 percent for uh, of violations of their own standards for arsenic, cadmium, mercury, copper, copper lead, selenium. Uh, Argentina in 1989, 1990 has found violations in their own testing of 10 to 41 percent for lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic. Uh, there are others. Yeah. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record documents obtained by the subcommittee from USDA which show that foreign countries are reporting levels of heavy metals in their meat and poultry. Why doesn't USDA test imported meat and poultry for these unapproved compounds and heavy metals? And what are the implications to public health? Well, there's a uh, definite focus on, uh, on the domestic concerns, uh, you know, the drugs and, uh, and uh, pesticides are domestic concerns, and there's a lack of focus on uh, imported uh, products. There's also just no, uh, no standards for heavy metal, as Ed just uh, mentioned and laid out some of the heavy metals that uh, have been discovered. There's no standards in this country for, uh, for uh, those heavy metals. And as a result, I understand that uh, some of these countries have since been uh, stopped reporting uh, those results of their own tests because there's no standards in this country. There, there is one exception to that. There are some standards for ar arsenic in, meat, in uh, meat and poultry. At this time, I yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Congressman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I think the chairman uh, did an excellent job in asking about a number of specific questions with respect to the focus of this hearing, which is uh, chemical residue. I'd like to add, ask a few broader questions. I'd like to, since this is about the fifth hearing in a series of hearings this subcommittee has held, I wonder if you can succinctly give us a general idea um, do you believe that, the, that generally speaking, uh, the food uh, uh, that is purchased by consumers in the United States 
is is uh, subject to a high level of confidence in its safety and, and purity. I mean, you have a, I, I'm not discounting if problems do exist. You understand. It only takes one case of poisoning for for it to be a serious problem. But I'm trying to get an overview. What what's your view of the food supply in the United States? That's a you know, as an analyst, that's a very difficult answer uh, question to answer because. Um, you know, there's just very little data to, to sustain any kind of uh, judgment about uh, the overall safety. And, of course, you have to define what you mean by safety. What is safe? You know, it's, it's a relative term. But I have, have to say, after 10 years of working in this area, that uh, overall we certainly cannot say that the food supply is unsafe. It's very, it's very difficult, given all these studies, to say it's absolutely safe, and I don't think we're ever going to get to a uh, condition of absolute safety. Uh, we're always going to have those risks. Uh, but overall, I haven't stopped eating yet, uh, although I did weigh quite a bit more when I started uh, this work. But uh, I... Well, do you get a little, nervous? A general... you get a little nervous if you're at the food store doing the uh, Occasionally. family shopping? Yeah, I, I, I have to admit that I do uh, approach it a little differently now than I did uh, 10 years ago. But again, I wouldn't, uh, particularly as it deals with pesticides and uh, chemical residues, there's a general feeling that that's not quite as serious as uh, microbial, which I think is a very serious uh, situation that needs to be addressed immediately. But uh, on the other hand, just because there's no dead bodies uh, that are immediate doesn't mean it's not just as serious. So I think these are all problems. I think the biggest, ser the most serious problem is the concern of the consumer. If a consumer loses confidence, whether it's safe or it isn't safe, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference because uh, they're, going to, they're going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of people to bring about change. Yeah, you said in your opening statement, Mr. Harmon, that, that for a long time you and, the G and I think you were speaking for the GAO also in this, have advocated the, that the responsibility for food inspection be given to one agency. That's correct. Uh, do you have a recommendation as to which agency or a new agency or how would you approach that? Well, there's, there's problems no matter which direction you go, both uh, uh, political problems and, and uh, as well as uh, just uh, logistical problems. I think uh, the last time we were here, we stated that uh, probably the best way to go would be to try to create a, a, another single agency that would uh, pull all these things together because it's not just the creation of a single agency is going to solve the problem, is the system has to be re-engineered too, uh, using that uh, term that's fairly popular these days. Uh, but it does have to be re-engineered, and uh, there's, there's problems moving it to FDA, and there's, there's certainly problems uh, uh, putting it all into USDA which, uh, with consumer confidence. Uh, so I, I, if, if uh, we haven't as an agency come down in any particular position on this, but uh, probably if pushed, we would, we would, uh, would argue for a single, a single agency that's probably cre recreated out of, uh, out of what exists now and not try to... In other words, at least as you can see it now, you would place this responsibility in an agency that doesn't presently exist. That's right. I think that we've actually taken the position that it should be a health-based, uh, uh, an agency with a health-based focus. Mm -hmm. So there is at least one that might fit that bill. Well, and let me say, I, 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 I lean in that direction, too. Uh, I've had some differences with some things uh, the United States Department of Agriculture has done lately. But I think that there is an inherent conflict, regardless of which administration is in authority and regardless who is secretary, when an agency is responsible for marketing uh, our food products and ensuring the safety too, which if they raise the alarm could interfere with the, with the marketing uh, responsibility of the agency. I, I, I see that as an eternal tug of war, as long as both responsibilities remain with the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So I think placing the responsibility in a health-based organization is, is the way to go and without meaning any offense to uh, anyone at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I would like to ask you about one other matter. And, and once again, I'm speaking generally. I don't want to focus on any one industry or any one product in the question I'm about to ask you. But you, you, you've spoken favorably uh, uh, in the past about the HACCP program, which is the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point program. That's, that's a program which is intended to uh, press more responsibility on the food manufacturers. I wonder if either of you could elaborate on that program a bit. Well, it, what it does, it, it shifts uh, the responsibility and the uh, control, so to speak, to a prevention mode instead of uh, after the fact uh, detection uh, mode. And it, it, it sets it up in a way that, that you are looking at the whole process 
uh, not just the process within one, the manufacturer, but from the farm all the way to the table, of uh, the points where you're, li where you're more likely to have contamination, where you're more likely to have, uh, and that's scientifically determined, more likely to have uh, contamination entering into the, into the food supply. And then you monitor that, those points. And those are the points that, uh, and that you would try to reduce even the amount of contamination that may be, that may be occurring. Uh, and that's, you, an in, that's an industry. We're, we're, our, we're, we're promoting that as an industry policy as opposed to a government policy. Well, that's, well it becomes that? a government policy in the sense that's the, that's the overall system that right. you are, you are uh, using. The government becomes part of that system in overseeing that system to make sure that it is working and that it is identifying those areas where uh, improvements need to be made in the system as well as areas of contamination. You wouldn't completely do away with their end product testing and you wouldn't necessarily do away, for example, in the in, uh, USDA, you wouldn't do away with uh, necessarily all their, their uh, inspectors online because there are some situations where that's, you need uh, visual inspections and uh, that's, it's, it's punching me here. So Can I... Uh, maybe give you an example which I will take from uh, EPA's testimony. Uh, they're going to talk about the issue of the pesticide on oats that got into the cereal. Uh, and I quote here, the, uh, the misuse continued for more than a year in part because no system was in place at the industry level to monitor raw materials or finished food products. Well, in fact, no system is in place at the federal level either. Uh, and there is no monitoring and no requirement for this system. The HACCP system that you know we have supported in the past and some agencies are moving to in some areas would in fact require that industry had such a system in place and that the federal government monitored it so that we would start at food production and monitor it all the way until it went to the consumer's table as opposed to now where we test at the end and you know we found this uh, uh, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the cereal maker didn't know about this for a year, but neither did the federal government. Despite their, they'll cite, you know, 85,000 tests and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it was basically luck that we found this right. at all. And, and, and I'm out of time, but I just want to conclude with, I think that is the point. I think I want to stress again, since it's come up, that the uh, uh, particular uh, misuse of a chemical was by a contractor that the cereal company was contracting with. They didn't know about it. They didn't authorize it. And once they found out about it, uh, took the product off the market. Uh, but we, we do have to have a system that would detect, e even, even this, this may have even, I, I'm not sure, but this may have even been a, a total fraudulent act uh, perpetrated on the, uh, I, don't, I don't want to get into that as much as a system has to be in place to detect anything that can go wrong anywhere uh, in the system. Apparently, in fact, Mr. Shifty, you know, the contractor did this to <coughs> save money. Uh, without telling the right, exactly. cereal maker, General Mills. Um, but in, in effect, this is where the system is inherently flawed. They're not required to have any system to go back and check on their contractor's actions to, to monitor the raw materials or the finished product that they're getting, and the federal government doesn't monitor their system for doing that because, in fact, it doesn't exist. And it's one of the inherent flaws in the system. I, I think you're going to hear a lot of support uh, from what I've read of the testimonies that the other people are going to be presenting here for the HACCP approach. I, I thank you, gentlemen. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, I yield to Congressman Micah. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, uh, I'm interested in the issue of uh, risk and risk assessment and uh, also been trying to get the Congress to do something it usually doesn't do and, and that's uh, think uh, about and think about the uh, the cost and benefit of some of the these regulations and attempts to uh, uh, to monitor every single activity out there without looking at the most cost effective means and uh, the means that will ensure public health, safety, et cetera. Uh, I, I want to take on a couple questions of risk in, in particular. I, I don't think people should be lulled into thinking the government can in, ensure at every single stage uh, the quality of, uh, uh, of food. Uh, for example, in the instance that was just cited uh, if someone had sprayed, say, some type of toxic chemical in the uh, truck that took uh, this particular product to market, uh, 
you can't have inspectors going out uh, uh, inspecting every every uh, transport that transports these items. When it gets to the shelf, uh, you have mom and pop grocery stores, or you have um, large chains uh, that have warehouses, and you can't have someone. Uh, running around doing a chemical analysis of every bug spray that's been sprayed in those stores. It, 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 are some of these assumptions correct? Uh, they are absolutely correct, Congressman, and uh, I don't want to give the impression at all that we're advocating that kind of a system. Well, again, I, you know, the, the thing we've been trying to get across here is let's look at, you know, where there's the most likelihood of some damage being done, concentrate our resources on those real risks uh, and not make people jump through a thousand uh, hoops and uh, swat at flies and miss the elephants as our policy is so often done in, in Washington. Uh, I noted in your, let's see, page five here, it says matters for con congressional consideration. And that's really what we have to concentrate on here is, is things that we can do from a practical standpoint. On page five in your executive summary, you said an industry-operated risk-based system that integrates residue prevention, detection, and quality uh, control from the farm through the slaughterhouse established with FSIS uh, assistance and oversight would be more effective than the current federal program. Can you take a moment and talk about uh, the risk-based system that you see uh, creating that would be most effective, say, for residue prevention in the detection and quality uh, control area? And also, do you have any specific legislative proposals uh, that, would, uh, uh, that we could act on? Let me uh, just briefly say that, uh, that this system, the HACCP system, is based on a risk assessment of where your, your key uh, problems and areas of contamination may occur. And I'll ask Ed to, to talk in a little more detail. But also, uh, with, with respect to a specific legislative, uh, the only legislation that we've uh, worked with and has been on a more informal basis was with the Senate side uh, with regard to meat and poultry, where we've uh, given some legislative language which has been passed on to the administration in terms of changing the legislation for meat and poultry inspection. But, uh, uh, is the administration planning any uh, recommendations to us, or do you have any? Uh, yes, I believe they are. Uh, what's the agenda for getting that to us? Well, I think Mr. Taylor can answer that in a little more detail, but uh, as I understand it, th they've taken their first steps with uh, recent efforts to, uh, to develop uh, microbial testing and uh, processes and procedures which will improve that area, which is, of course, the area of uh, uh, real critical concern right now. But uh, they are moving towards uh, and advocating a HACCP type system and I think they'll be advocating and, and proposing that type of legislation or the legislative changes that need to be made to allow them to do that. Maybe Ed you could comment a minute yeah. and then I want to get to one other area. Uh, yes, um, this particular recommendation reports to, uh, relates to uh, FSIS's uh, resident testing program but we have a similar one in the overall report and we also have one that we've made several times uh, to food safety in general. Uh, a couple of things would occur. We would rank risk across food items. Uh, we would rank risk uh, based on the potential things that could happen to those food items. For example, microbial contamination, which produces immediate injury and death, and I know you sat in on the hearings related to E. coli and that, would probably rank higher than chemical residues. Then within each of those areas, uh, you know, companies would be required to look at their their systems, their processes, uh, their production practices to identify risk areas in design control systems. And to relate to an example you gave, if there was a risk of, say, the oats in this case being hauled in a truck that has been sprayed with a pesticide or a carcinogen for some reason, mm -hmm. then if that was identified as a potential risk, they would have a control point that might require uh, periodic sampling of these trucks to see whether or not they were being cleaned properly and stuff like that. If uh, spraying for bugs in a grocery store or a processing plant uh, was a risk area, uh, they would have to have a, a system uh, that would be monitored to some extent by the federal government that says, uh, uh, that establishes controls for that process to make sure, for example, that there isn't food 
present, uh, or food products or raw materials present when they're spraying. And this, by the way, the example you cited is really uh, uh, pretty germane because uh, many times uh, accidental, <coughs> accidental spraying of grains uh, or things like the oats or deliberate spraying but with the wrong chemical are in fact what causes residue problems. But nobody is really required to check or monitor that on a, uh, a very specific basis. Now, all the programs you're talking about are domestic. Uh, let me divert to the second half and we can get into some of your specific recommendations and I hope you uh, provide them to the uh, committee, for, you know, for legislative changes. But um, one of the things that has disturbed me and uh, I, I'm concerned about uh, is, uh, you know, we're more and more of the international marketplace. And uh, some of the things you describe may very well protect our consumers domestically, and maybe we do a half good job here in, in, in achieving those goals. But um, uh, if you go to the market today, uh, the goods are from all over yes. the world. Now we are opening up uh, with NAFTA and some of the other things. I, you know, I get a tomato in Florida. I, I, I'm not sure where it's been, what it's been sprayed with, what residue is on it. You open a can of uh, fish from uh, some other place, uh, you know, uh, the other end of the world. You uh, had an apple from uh, New Zealand. Uh, God only knows what you know they do in New Zealand with their apples, but uh, uh, what what are we going to do? Uh, I mean, you can monitor some of what's going on here, but these products, a uh, uh, wave of products coming into this country, uh, and and residues, uh, chemicals that are, have been banned in this country for years. Uh, uh, you, you have a tremendous potential uh, for contamination and problems. Uh, uh, what are, how can we do this? And you, you certainly aren't going to uh, uh, inspect every Mexican transport uh, uh, or be out in the fields and see what they're doing to this, this product. Uh, what kind of assurance do we have that we have some minimal protection in, in place? Uh, we could have pristine uh, rules for the U.S. and letting this stuff in and, uh, and, and having problems. Uh, that we don't even know about. There's a lot of issues uh, with uh, the uh, importation of, of food and, and what we require for testing and making sure that food is safe. Right now, it's uh, it's as far as we're concerned, is 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 uh, not is in good as good a condition as as uh, the domestic program. But uh, because. We simply don't test for some things for imported food that uh, even so. The consumer is at much more at risk. Uh, taking uh, and, and consuming a, a foreign uh, produced uh, product, say particularly vegetables and uh, things of that sort, than dom uh, domestic. It Is again that depends on the systems and the processes that, that foreign country has. And in the, in the, in but the, uh, you don't really have any ways to monitor, in which we're already say monitoring uh, monitoring our domestic uh, production. No, we have, we have even less control over foreign imports. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're more risky. Some of them, in fact, may be safer. Uh, and, and some of the agencies are making efforts uh, to do more. For example, I know FDA is working on uh, MOUs with some countries related to certain products. But clearly, uh, we can do more. Uh, all countries exporting to the United States are required to meet our food safety standards. And in fact, if we went to a risk-based HACCP standard that required them to uh, have HACCP type programs, they would have to do that and demonstrate it to us uh, in order to have their product imported. So that certainly would be helpful. Well, I think my time has expired. I want to get back to some other uh, areas that uh, continue in this uh, line of questioning. But uh, you, you still give me grave concern about products coming in. I think domestically, we do a pretty good job but I see more and more foreign products on our shelves and uh, there's no assurance that in fact these have met the same quality uh, uh, standards or inspection standards as uh, domestically in, produced food. In many cases it's true. Thank you. The gentleman is right. His time has expired. Uh, this time I call on Congressman Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding yet another hearing on food safety. Uh, sorry I was late. I had an unavoidable conflict, although I see our, our side seems fairly well represented at this point. Uh, 
I, I may be going, going over some ground that the chairman has already gone over or that Mr. Schiff has gone over, if so, cut me short. But my questions are in two general areas. First, of course, is in the area of restructuring. Uh, I think the hearing in May we discussed the issue of what makes the most sense in terms of food safety within the federal government. At that time, I, I questioned uh, USDA officials, as I recall. They were not uh, sympathetic to, at least that was my impression, the uh, National Performance Review. NPR as opposed to NRP, uh, and I found that rather surprising. Maybe I was naive thinking that because the Vice President uh, in reinventing government had proposed that we move to one food safety agency and that it be in a health-based agency, namely FDA, that that was something the administration would, would support. Uh, but apparently the administration does not support that, at, uh, at least at, uh, consistently. My question to you, having just read your report, uh, is are, are, are you concluding that one agency can indeed handle all of the functions of food safety, uh, and that would include new functions that you suggest in your report? Yes, we do. And are you saying, uh, based on your research, uh, that it should be the Food and Drug Administration, or are you saying that it should be a new agency to be set up under the auspices of HHS, or are you saying it should be a new independent agency or department? What's your recommendation in that regard? We would uh, argue for a uh, new agency that's a health-based agency, which would imply it would probably be some way or shape or form tied into HHS. Okay. In doing so, would you envision that uh, many of the uh, costs that are currently involved in food safety, both at USDA uh, and at FDA, and for that matter at EPA, uh, would be cost savings that could be in turn shifted to this new department? Uh, that's, uh, that's true. We've never done analysis of that. Of course, it would depend on, on the, uh, how you would structure it and whether you would move some of the, some of the thing, what you would move into that agency. But there, are, there is a lot of duplication and uh, that could possibly be avoided. Uh, at the same time, moving to a HACCP type system could result in some cost savings. I think the, uh, our big concern here is not a cost issue, it's more is, uh, is the system really doing what it's supposed to be doing. We just see all kinds of inconsistencies and problems with this system that exists right now that has evolved over the last uh, 90 years or so, and uh, it just needs to be revamped. But we think there would be opportunities for cost savings as part of doing that. Yeah, we've, uh, uh, we've said that shifting is to either a single agency or there's, of course, been discussions of shifting it to, uh, you know, FDA or someplace within HHS would not, in effect, let you do away with the $500 million that uh, FSIS spends on meat and poultry inspection, that there's so much that needs to be done that that money would have to be, that money and the personnel, the resources would have to be given to the new agency because there's a lot of things, uh, as uh, Mr. Mike alluded to in that, the uh, foreign inspections and uh, uh, doing a better job domestically. There, there's so much that isn't being done now uh, that there wouldn't probably be any net cost savings. You would have to move the money and the uh, personnel uh, with it. Again, it would depend on how you structure it. And, uh, uh, we, as we have with USDA, hopefully would, uh, if, if this committee or would uh, want us to do that, try to start developing some databases which would give some analysis of, of what would happen to people and it would be fairly difficult because USDA is just one agency, the others would have to get into their personnel bases, but we could uh, start thinking about doing that type of thing. I think that would be very interesting to, to those of us who are concerned about food safety as, as well as the costs, federal government and so on. You name. Uh, a number of uh, characteristics in the current system which are flawed. One is du uh, duplicity, another is the, uh, the duplicate, duplicative nature of the, of the programs. Um, you, you talk about uh, diffuse responsibilities and the inefficiencies uh, in, the, in the current system. So it seems to me there are some cost savings. Uh, the HACCP program is, as well, I think, uh, could involve some cost savings if done properly. And then there will be some cost increases, of course, with increased uh, monitoring and enforcement. And uh, I think that would be something very interesting for those of us following that. The FSIS program, I think, is coming to the floor in some form uh, under agriculture reorganization uh, this week or next. And uh, so I assume that that debate will at least be on the House side yet, yet this year, and maybe uh, further questions will, will, be, will be raised. Uh, one quick question on the HACCP program before my time is up. It, it seems to me that uh, there is a consensus that uh, prevention, whether it's in health care or food safety, makes sense, that there are certain uh, 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 ways to do that within the, the current system uh, through a voluntary program. 
and that uh, end, end product uh, testing is not the most effective way to get at food safety. My question to you is, have you analyzed what the costs are to industry uh, to do the so-called voluntary program, which uh, I guess some would argue isn't, isn't voluntary. In fact, it would be a program that would be uh, mandated, but it would be voluntary to the companies to undertake it in, in the sense that it wouldn't be a federal program, it would be a company program. Uh, and then if you, could, if you could give us just a couple of uh, thoughts on uh, how industry has reacted to the, uh, to the HACCP program. Let me uh, first just say a few general things, and Ed may have some specifics on cost. I, I'm not aware of it. I know we haven't done anything in GAO uh, on, on cost issues with, for industry. But industry is in the lead here, I think, right now uh, with HACCP. Uh, I think they see this as a way to improve the quality of their products and, uh, and the safety of their products. And so in a lot of cases, in food, and I know we've done work in the, in the meat inspection, in the meat poultry area, and in doing this work, we, we've found a number of industries that are already moving towards a HACCP type system because that's a, that's a real advantage to them and it could become a competitive advantage to them uh, if they can work out a system that does this type of thing. But let me, Ed might have some thoughts on the cost. Um, I, I don't have great specific details on the cost, but we did in earlier work that we did on meat and poultry with microbial testing, for example, we went out and I think we queried about 170 plants of various sizes and found out that about half of them were uh, doing microbial testing and, had, and, and that was on the basis of they considered that a high risk and they were trying to identify points in their production cycle, which is related to HACCP. Uh, the industry, uh, industry group told us that they were supportive of it. Uh, most of the industry groups we talked to related to this uh, were supportive of it. Many companies are out there doing it, and I can tell you one cereal maker that I understand is taking a $82 million write-off uh, wishes they had one, uh, and it probably would have cost them a lot less than $82 million. Uh, I can tell you a, a fast food hamburger chain that wishes they had a better one last year or two years ago. Uh, so while there would be some additional cost to industry, they probably pale in comparison to when your company is named uh, as having a, uh, a, a unregistered, unapproved pesticide on your cereal or whether children die from eating your hamburgers. Uh, the, the, the cost pale by comparison. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Portman. Let me, and, and just before we close, let me just ask uh, just a couple other things. Uh, what happens when USDA finds a residue violation? Uh, well, in the past, from 89 to 92, we basically found that uh, 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 not very much. For example, they reported 21,000 violations to uh, FDA. Because of uh, limited resources, FDA is only uh, followed up on about 20 percent of them, and there were in that period, I believe, uh, 15 uh, actions taken. Uh, most of the things that were done were uh, warning letters that carried no penalty uh, or fine. Was anybody prosecuted? There was uh, one prosecution in that period, um, and there's clearly a problem with repeat offenders. You know, that's... Yeah. There's a problem with repeat offenders. I mean, men, uh, not only do they find sometimes as many as 4,000 violations, periodically uh, some of these are from the same operation. Uh, for example, in 1992, uh, while the number, this is the physical number of repeat violators are down, for example, the uh, company at the top of the list had 65 residue violations. Clearly sending them warning letters isn't doing a lot of good. Uh, there were other ones with 28, 24, 18, 14. It was on a couple pages uh, with those that have more than one violation. And some of these, um, and if you want, I'll give you an example or two, have yeah. been going on for years before anything was done. In other words, more than 21,000, only one prosecution. It was only one prosecution. Uh, there were, I think, uh, I believe, two citations and 12 uh, injunctions in that uh, four-year period from 89 to 92. Uh, in addition, I know that having looked at their testimony, FDA is going to say they're getting a lot stronger because they're going after more injunctions. That happens to be 11 in 1994. And I know that two of those 11 involve 
uh, producers that have been having problems for, in one case, seven years, in another case, nine years, and have been repeatedly notified. They've been sent warning letters, which they didn't respond to. Uh, FDA and the states have gone in there and cited them over and over and, you know, demanded corrective actions. And after nine years, and I couldn't count up the number of violations, they've asked justice in uh, uh, August of this year for an injunction against one of them. The other case got on for seven years, and they're just asking for an injunction now. So I would say that there's not a lot of clout. Let me just say that um, uh, that's very disturbing. Uh, and you can expect a formal request coming from this committee uh, asking for the, the best way to consolidate various food programs uh, because we just can't continue you know, to do business as usual. You know, I know uh, some things in terms of microbial is something that uh, you can see right away, but when I think about all the others that uh, are cancer causing, and uh, we do not know in terms of, you know, the real effect there. So I think that we need to become more aggressive. We're talking about, for a while around here, we're talking about health care reform. You know, finally we stopped, you know, uh, talking about it. But I think that any kind of reform has to look at these matters. And without that, we're not doing too much reforming. So let me thank both of you for your testimony. We look forward to working with you. And you can expect that request. Yes, uh, I yield. Another round. I had not planned to, but if you have a question, I'd be delighted to yield to the gentleman. If I may, uh, just a moment. Uh, just a couple of questions, again, uh, that I didn't uh, finish on. Again, I'm, I'm very concerned about the question of uh, Im uh, the increasing amount of imported food. And it, that is increasing in, a, in the supply of food that's available. And your, your report also pointed out on page 57 uh, said, Finally, U.S. federal agencies have even less leverage in addressing these, the problem of imported foods. Consequently, chemicals that are a concern because they are used in exporting countries but not in the United States may be entering the domestic food supply. So we have more food coming in from these foreign countries. And I, I'd venture to say that sometime in the last year you've had Italian pasta, uh, where, uh, which night. Uh, <laughs> last night... Uh, Mexican tomatoes, which uh, I mean have just about put us out of business in Florida, and uh, Chilean grapes, for example, South America, uh, Central America, Europe, uh, and we, we have less and less control over those areas. So this this is a concern to me, and I'm not sure uh, if we are uh, moving forward in the right direction. Again, looking at some of the risks, so we spend more time with the federal agency, which already has certain authority and is not obviously either enforcing it or whatever, and we have more food coming in to our supply from other sources we have less control over. So that's an area that I wanted to see addressed. In a previous hearing, I asked what we were doing in developing technologies to detect some of these residues, et cetera. Uh, as sort of my wind-up question, I see this chairman squirming. Um, uh, are we doing anything in the technology development area? And I, I think when they came before us before our budget, uh, the budget <laughs> for this area was, had very little recommended to, uh, uh, to assist. Has there been an improvement or are we looking at technologies and things that can assist us in, say, quick detection? There are efforts uh, going on in that area, but it's not nearly enough to deal with the volume of... Uh, it'll, it'll never solve the problem. Yeah, it's not going to solve it's, the problem. It's not the way to solve the problem. You just cannot. End product testing, besides being extremely expensive, is, is generally destructive. Well, I mean, also, we talked about in the uh, uh, micro... microbial, I guess is the term. Microbial testing, yes. uh, Testing and things of that sort. Uh, are they moving forward with developing better technologies there? Yes, they are. They are attempting to do that. And you do need some of that technology in a HACCP type system. Uh, and industry will need some of that technology in a HACCP type system. So I, uh, but regarding imports, we've done work on imports uh, specifically in certain foreign countries. And right now we have some work going on with dealing with Chile. And it depends on the country, I think, uh, in terms of the, the safety. And, and But there's a lot of... Uh, 
of, uh, they're not a lot, but there are pesticides other countries are using. They're not, not approved in this country, and, and they can get into here. Uh, but there's, in fact, more risk for products coming in from these other countries, which are coming in in larger numbers than there is, say, risk the in domestic. Rate, the violation rate, for example, for uh, imported uh, uh, fruits and vegetables <coughs> is, uh, I think, in the neighborhood of uh, uh, four to four or five to up to nine percent, depending on what vegetable, what you're checking it for, compared to just a couple of percent for U.S. products. Uh -huh. Then the o only other area, and I'll end here quickly. It says uh, one of your recommendations is having uh, FSIS shift the primary responsibility for day-to-day -day residue prevention, detection, and control to the industry. Uh, and under federal monitoring, yes, under a federally approved system that they would. Monitor. I don't have any problem with that. I think that's good. Uh, I'm just concerned that we already have certain uh, laws and controls and regulations, and it doesn't sound like the enforcement record is very good. So, if you have uh, if you have suggestions or recommendations on how we tighten up the enforcement. Uh, I think the chairman is right. We probably need to stand back and take a look at what all the laws would be affected by, by a, a consolidation of food safety uh, federal responsibilities into one agency. And uh, uh, there's going to be substantial and it's, uh, it's certainly not going to be an easy process. Uh, but uh, the other thing I might mention regarding uh, the uh, imports is that we are also recommending that the Congress at least consider. Now, there's issues that have to be dealt with. I know Food and Drug has, has raised some of these issues. But consider uh, putting the same type of system on imported uh, products as uh, fruits and vegetables, for example, that it currently exists for meat and poultry, where the systems that other foreign countries use have to be equivalent. And, uh, and there is a, a decision made by USDA that those systems are equivalent for meat and poultry. To, to consider that type of a uh, system, which is really a HACCP uh, type system, if you go to HACCP here, you, they'd have to have that kind of a system. So that would that would increase your uh, reliability. But there are there are some issues that have to be dealt with in doing well, that. I thank you. I thank the chairman too. Um, I think we can work together in the next you. year and hopefully uh, incorporate some of your recommendations to improve what we're doing. Thank you. Let me thank you too. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to call the second panel to the table. Uh, Mike Taylor, Administrator of USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. Mr. Taylor. Accompanied by some colleagues, uh, Mr. Chairman. Will you please identify them? It's Dr. Richard Carnivale, Dr. John Pruka, and Dr. Bonnie Bunting. All right. Please come forward. It is the custom of this committee that we swear in. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. We do. Please note that they've answered in affirmative. Let the record reflect. Take your seat. <laughs> let me begin by first. Uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, before you begin, let me just say a few words. Uh, the subcommittee congratulates you on, on your appointment. As I said to you uh, when I visited with you last week, we have heard great things about you and we wish you well. Uh, as you know, this committee has been very critical of USDA meat and poultry inspection programs, I think rightfully so. Your appointment signals great promise that the department may finally be moving in the right direction. Uh, in, if, in fact, um, Today I signed on as a co-sponsor to H.R. 5055, the Administration's Pathogen Reduction Act. Uh, this bill begins to deal with the problems of microbial contamination, which has been talked about here a great deal this morning, of meat and poultry. I commend uh, President Clinton, uh, Secretary Espy, and you, Mr. Taylor, and your staff, and everybody who participated in the formulation of this bill. And I urge uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to seriously consider this measure. I plan to work with you to bring about the reform that is needed 
in our meat and poultry inspection program because our country needs it, our consumers need it, and most of all our children need it. So I'm not just going to stand and criticize. I plan to roll up my sleeves and work very closely with you to do everything that we can to make certain that the people are safe. And this is what we're talking about, from the field, from the farm to the fork. That's what we're talking about in terms of providing safety in those areas. But I also want you to know, Mr. Taylor, that this subcommittee has some real concerns about safety and labeling of meat and poultry products. At this hearing, in, as this hearing indicates, we will continue to vigorously exercise our oversight responsibilities to ensure that people are protected. And may I conclude by saying that the full text of your statement uh, that you submitted in writing will be included in the record. Uh, if you would just summarize within five minutes so that we allow the committee to raise questions, and you can see that we have a lot of questions. So at this time, I would uh, say to you, you can proceed in any way you wish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me first thank you for your kind words, and in particular for your uh, co-sponsorship of the Pathogen Reduction Act of 1994. This is a very important a piece of legislation that will contribute greatly to our ability to deal uh, with the foodborne illness problem in this country associated with meat and poultry products. I am pleased, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, to be here uh, before you today to discuss USDA's programs to regulate and prevent illegal and unsafe chemical residues and contaminants from entering the nation's meat and poultry supply. I am accompanied, as I indicated, by Dr. Richard Carnavale who is Assistant Deputy Administrator for Science and Technology, Dr. John Pruka, who is Deputy Administrator for International Programs, and representing the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, Dr. Bonnie Buntain, uh, who leads the Animal Production Food Safety Project. Mr. Chairman, this is my first congressional hearing in my new role as Administrator of the Food Safety and Inspection Service. I enter this job with a full understanding of the challenges we face in building a system of meat and poultry inspection that lives up fully to its public health responsibilities and that meets the public's high expectations regarding the safety of the food supply. Our job at FSIS is clear. We must build a system of inspection that capitalizes fully on what science and technology have to offer to reduce the risk of foodborne illness. And who we work for is also clear. Every person in this country who purchases or consumes a meat or poultry product relies on us to do the best job we can on their behalf. They, Mr. Chairman, are our constituency. To serve them well, we need to change. You, Mr. Chairman, know this. The oversight hearings you have held on our federal food safety programs, backed up by the several studies of the General Accounting Office, have played an important role in documenting the need for change in how federal regulators approach their food safety responsibilities. I applaud your leadership. As the efforts of this subcommittee have shown, it is time for a basic paradigm shift in food safety regulation. When it comes to chemical contaminants and microbial pathogens, it is no longer sufficient to rely solely on federal inspectors to detect and correct problems after they occur. We need to move toward risk-based systems of preventive controls under which food manufacturers take responsibility for systematically preventing problems, and federal inspectors are able to verify and take actions to ensure that such systems are working effectively. We plan to propose regulations this fall that will require all meat and poultry plants to adopt the system of preventive controls known as HACCP. HACCP is a widely accepted tool that, if properly implemented, will make food safer. It is based on the simple premise that safety must be built into a food product at each step in the process, rather than relying entirely on end product testing to detect and eliminate problems. HACCP plans must address all potential food safety hazards, including those posed by illegal chemical residues and contaminants. Under HACCP, each plant will adopt appropriate controls to prevent harmful contamination, and FSIS will inspect and conduct tests as needed to ensure those controls are working. Let me emphasize one important point, Mr. Chairman. HACCP is not a substitute for careful federal oversight of the safety of our nation's food supply. The public expects vigilance on our part, and in the case of meat and poultry inspection, 
increased efforts to reduce the risk of foodborne illness associated with microbial pathogens such as E. coli 015787 and salmonella. We are making that effort. HACCP will increase our ability to improve the safety of the food supply and protect public health. HACCP will also help ensure that imported meat and poultry products meet our food safety standards and legal requirements. As we move to HACCP, those who export to the United States will have to establish equivalent systems of preventive controls. Mr. Chairman, the General Accounting Office has made a number of recommendations for improvement in our chemical residue program. We will consider all of them carefully and we will work with Mr. Harmon and his colleagues at GAO so that we can benefit fully from the insights they have gained during their study. We will be focusing particularly on how we can shape the program to support our transition to HACCP. For example, we do need to better target our chemical evaluation system so that we can provide sound guidance to companies on the hazard analysis component of their HACCP plans. We need to target chemicals that have the greatest potential to result in violative residues or pose a public health problem. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to stress how important it is that we be clear about what our national residue program test results can tell us about violative residues and what they can't tell us. The results we obtain from the samples we collect and test show that the rates of violation are generally infrequent among those samples. For the specific chemicals and commodities we target, we generally sample at a level we believe is sufficient to detect with 95% confidence a residue violation if it occurs in 1% or more of the animal population. But we do not have the resources nor do we think it would be a good use of our scarce resources to test at that level for every one of the thousands of chemical commodity combinations. Thus, we cannot statistically extrapolate the results we have to the entire spectrum of combinations in the food supply, and we cannot make definitive, statistically valid statements about all residues. We have instead a reasonably detailed and targeted series of snapshots that give us reasonable confidence that violative residues are not occurring frequently. We can improve our targeting and other elements of our program, but the real solution is to install HACCP systems of preventive controls that don't rely on federally financed testing to detect violations. I am confident that FSIS is capable of making important changes in its program to protect the public health. I've been impressed with the knowledge, commitment, and motivation of the employees at the agency, and I believe that with a sound regulatory strategy in place, much can be accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Right. Let me thank you for your excellent testimony. Let me say up to this point, you lived up to your billing. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you and, and uh, in your statement. But let me just sort of uh, uh, raise a few questions with you. Listening to your testimony, it seems to me that you agree with GAO that the current federal approach to monitoring chemical residues and contaminants in foods, in food is flawed? It, it's flawed in the sense that we currently rely on government testing, sampling and testing of products to determine, to verify uh, whether residues are violative. And because of the fact that we can never uh, hope to test completely enough to provide the kind of assurance that I think this subcommittee is looking for, uh, and that I believe the people, the public, expect, uh, we need a different paradigm. And we're so much better off, and this is the power of the HACCP paradigm, building in controls to prevent violative residues in the first place, rather than relying solely on chasing around to find those violations after they occur. There's got to be a combination. Uh, you don't set up HACCP systems and not then check to verify that they're working properly. There still needs to be some sampling. But we, we can't do a federal sampling program that all by itself is, is going to address this issue. Yeah, how can we, Congress, help bring about the paradigm shift in food safety regulations that is needed? I mean, how can we assist in that? Well, I think, uh, as I said in my testimony, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the studies that GAO has conducted and the hearings that you have held have certainly helped focus attention and build the case uh, for this paradigm shift. Um, and I think it is fair to say it's very clear that the agencies are acting on that, that understanding. FDA has proposed rules for seafood. We will be proposing rules for meat and poultry, HACCP rules uh, this fall. Uh, I think that uh, there are 
um, uh, some, some things that we have asked Congress for, uh, the Department of Agriculture, the pathogen reduction legislation in particular, uh, so that in our statute we can have built into our statutory regime a very clear mandate to target microbial pathogens. Uh, that's the big food safety issue as far as uh, meat and poultry products are concerned. Uh, and we certainly uh, want to have the full weight of Congress behind our efforts uh, there. Right. Your statement says that the compound evaluation system can be useful in setting monitoring priorities. But GAO found that the system is extremely backlogged. How do you plan to fix the ranking system? Well, I think the, uh, the appearance of a backlog stems in part from the fact that the list that we're looking at is a, is a very lengthy list that, that was not given a lot of scrutiny in, as it was prepared. So there are a lot of chemicals on that list that arguably shouldn't be among our, our priorities for review. Um, uh, and so we need to do a, a, a better job of, of, of winnowing out the, the chemicals that really deserve careful review. I, I think the, the, the objective, I think the focus of our efforts uh, needs to be to, to target on those chemicals that, from a public health standpoint and from, from the standpoint of the likelihood of violative residues, are of greatest concern and be sure we have those identified and analysis in place to support, uh, as I said in my testimony, the hazard uh, analysis uh, efforts of companies who we will be asking to establish preventive controls for these very chemicals. Uh, so. The focus of our effort, I think, needs to be to, to look at that list and look at the whole residue program in terms of how it can best support uh, HACCP. Yeah, I think that the question that was sort of raised uh, earlier by uh, uh, Congressman Mike, I think, why does USDA routinely, why doesn't USDA routinely test imported meat for pesticides and animal drugs approved for use in foreign countries but not approved or banned in the United States? Uh, with independent testing, how can USDA truly verify f foreign country testing results? If I may just take one moment to, to explain what we do with respect to, 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 to try to protect uh, the, the, the American consumer from violative residues in these products, and then address specifically your question because the context is important. Uh, we, under our statute, um, may allow import of, of meat and poultry products only after having reviewed a foreign syst uh, country's system of inspection and found it to be equivalent to ours. We do that based on reviewing uh, their laws and regulations and also visiting and, and looking at their inspection program to be sure that it's equivalent uh, to ours. We then conduct, uh, and, and those programs have to include an approach to chemical residues that is equivalent to our system here for looking at domestic chemical residues. We then do conduct a what we call a reinspection of that product when it has come into the when it comes into the United States. Even though it has been inspected by a foreign authority whose program we have judged to be equivalent, we then reinspect at the port of entry, and we we sample about 10 percent of the shipments and and do some tests, uh, and we do a certain amount of testing. Uh, the number of samples uh, uh, you know, is in the between 10 and 20,000 a year uh, and, and fairly rarely find violative samples. What you're putting your finger on though is, is, the, is the question of given the same reality with respect to the international program which is that we cannot ever hope to test enough to identify every violative situation, how can we be sure that preventive controls are in place so, to prevent that violation? And again, we when we move to HACCP, foreign inspection systems, in order to be equivalent, in order, in, or, and in order to support exports to this country, will have to adopt the same equivalent systems of preventive controls, including with respect to these, these products, these unapproved uh, pesticides or, or animal drugs. And so we will have a far better system in place for preventing the, the problem. And then the question remains, I mean, how much testing should we be doing? How much a resource should we be expending in our oversight of that system uh, at, at, that at that port of entry point? And I don't think we've got a good answer to the question of how much testing is enough. We don't test now because we rely on the foreign system. Uh, I think as we move towards HACCP, we're going to have to answer this question generically, not just for unapproved pesticides uh, or antibiotics or, or, dr or animal drugs. We're going to have to answer the question generically, how much testing to check the operation of, of HACCP systems is appropriate. 
Uh, and that's going to require a, a discussion that involves not just the agencies, but the public and uh, I think the Congress, because there's a resource issue there as well. Right. Thank you very much. At this time, I yield to uh, Congressman Schiff. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Taylor, a couple of things. Uh, one of the controversies that has um, uh, come to the attention of this subcommittee is a controversy involving uh, meat, the meat industry in general, and in particular, <coughs> an allegation by the red meat industry that it is subject to a stricter standard of health and safety with respect to such issues as fecal contamination than the poultry industry is subject to. What I'd like to know is, have you had enough time in your present position for that, is, for that to have come to your attention to the extent that you can evaluate it and respond to that? I, I certainly can respond in general terms. Uh, uh, these two programs uh, developed uh, and their, their basic elements were put in place at different times. The, the poultry program being relatively new uh, came up in the 60s. The, the meat inspection program dates back to the beginning of this century. And, and out of those differing historical origins, there are, they've been documented by a study that was done a couple of years ago by an outside uh, group that the department contracted with. There are a number of, of differences uh, in, in the regulatory schemes and the requirements. And one example, uh, the Secretary Espy account encountered when he came in was that there was a zero tolerance for fecal contamination of red meat on the books. It was not being enforced very aggressively. Uh, but there was no similar zero tolerance for fecal contamination on poultry. Um, he's proposed to establish one. The reg proposal was established, uh, published uh, this summer to establish that sort of zero <coughs> tolerance for, for poultry. I think uh, what I've been focusing on is, is the future and, and how we can be sure that both of these product categories, both red meat and poultry, are subject to an appropriate set of public health driven food safety standards, focusing uh, much of our attention, of course, on microbial pathogens and be sure that in both cases, we've got adequate sets of preventive controls in place. Both, both regimes will be obviously subject to the HACCP requirement and we're considering approaches to microbial testing that would apply to both red meat and, and poultry. So even though there's been this uh, difference that, that comes from some different historical uh, origins, I think you're going to see a lot of convergence as we bring the science of microbiology into the program and, and establish an appropriate floor and, and set of expectations for the, the entire industry. Mr. Taylor, uh, one other question. As, as I'm sure you've heard in the testimony already today, uh, there is a great deal of discussion of centering all government food safety responsibilities in a single agency. And that single agency may well be over on the health side of the government organization rather than on the Department of Agriculture side. I wonder, and, and I know you're head of an agency now, of course it deals with this issue, but I, I want to assure you that this has been approached from an administrative point of view and not through any uh, indictment of your agency uh, or, or of you or of the people you work with. With that in mind, do you have an opinion as to whether the consolidation of all federal food service inspection safety would be best in one agency? And if so, what agency would that be? Um, it, I'll give you my thoughts about that. Um, if, you, if we were starting from scratch today to design a federal food regulatory program, I don't think any of us would design it the way it exists today organizationally because as this committee has documented, as GAO has found, we, we do have a system where jurisdiction is divided, um, there's, there's a lack of consistency in, in the statutory <coughs> regimes. It, it's not an ideal system. Um, and I think it's a very fair question for the Congress to be asking. Uh, the system is a, is a creature of the statutory uh, framework that has evolved, again, historically over a period of years to get us where we are today. Uh, and I think given the public interest and the food safety issue, it's a fair <coughs> question to be asking. I have a very specific job to do at the Food Safety and Inspection Service, which is consuming 110% of my attention, which is to bring science of microbiology into our program and to deal with the very immediate issue of how we can reduce the risk of foodborne illness from microbial pathogens. And that is, that's the focus, regardless of the discussion that might be had about organizational change, that's got, that is the focus of this program and, and, and my focus 
um, at, at FSIS. Uh, this is a question ultimately that uh, I think will be answered by the Congress, um, and it, it's certainly a fair question to be asking. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I yield to Congressman Michael. Welcome, uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, I know you're a new kid on the block, and uh, that only goes so far, Mr. Michael. <laughs> I think if you ask, think <laughs> ask some of your colleagues who've been before me from your uh, agency, uh, I, I do allow a grace period, though. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but uh, one of the great things about serving here and just you know being here now 20 months is you develop an institutional memory, and these people come back. I always say God brings them back to me, so I get another shot at uh, finding out if they followed through on uh, on what they said they were going to do. But uh, you've got quite a challenge, and again, I look forward to working with you. There's there's a couple of things I want to talk about today. First of all, in this G these GAO uh, recommendations, um, it says they've identified five areas of weakness. I want to talk about a couple of them. First uh, is that chemical, chemicals posing similar risks may be regulated differently under different laws. And then you, we get into the problem. Uh, it says uh, the NPRS basic flaw in the choice of chemicals tested and the method, methodology used to select samples for testing. In addition, the program suffers from limited support from E, uh, EPA and EDA to identify potentially hazardous chemicals and to prosecute violations. Uh, how are we doing with uh, my good friends at EPA uh, as far as cooperating? Uh, if well, I, I think there's a good record of cooperation. That That's not what this says. Well, the, um, I mean, are you are we working? This is wait. The date is September 28th, 1994. Right. Let me, there's a lot of collaboration and coordination that goes on. Um, there's Is room, there hope? There's, there's room for improvement in, in that. Okay, are we, like, uh, is EPA working with you? Now, the other yeah. thing, too, is uh, getting into um, F, uh, FSIS can, cannot ensure that compounds present, presenting the greatest risks have been identified and are being tested for under the program. This occurs, one, because FSIS is ranked prioritized, in other words, prioritized. Only about a third of the 367 compounds it's identified <coughs> as being of potential concern for meat and poultry. And, and two, tests, uh, test methods have not been developed for all compounds. Furthermore, only 24 of the 56 compounds tested in 1992 were of high priority. So it looks like what we're doing now isn't really addressing the greatest risk, great, addressing the greatest priority uh, uh, items. Uh, is that correct? Uh, I, I agree there's room for improvement in how we target those chemicals that pose the greatest concern with respect to violative residues and, and, and public health okay. concern. When, now, when will we have before us some proposals, specific legislative proposals, to correct uh, uh, what, what, what we've been talking about here well, today? This, on this specific issue, uh, Mr. Micah, focusing better on, on chemicals of greatest concern, um, I don't think the, uh, the solution is necessarily legislative. We think that... Well, within your agency, I mean, is there, is there going to be a, 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 we're going to do this, one, two, three, and, and what deadlines? Can you give me some the, estimate? The first major step forward towards addressing this will be our proposal this fall to require that, that all facilities have HACCP plans, the essence okay. of... And when will we expect that by uh, Thanksgiving, I, Christmas? I've said fall, so... Gift-wrapped uh, Christmas. I've said fall. That's our goal, to publish it this fall. Okay. Well, fall just started the 23rd, so we'll say by the beginning of winter. Uh, just the day before the beginning of winter is my goal. I just... What I... <laughs> <laughs> but I try to do... Did you say fall. Thanksgiving because of turkey? Yes. Well... <laughs> We won't get into their <laughs> turkey uh, and poultry inspection uh, uh, reports, but mm -hmm. in any event, uh, what I'm trying to do is just say when specifically. Right. So we're looking for, for some 
things there. Now, I hate to jump because I only get so much time and that light goes off in a hurry. But uh, let me uh, uh, ask you, too, the, one of the other problems identified here clearly is that, you know, there, there are uh, a very high number of violations, uh, very few uh, of these violations um, investigated, and then an even smaller number of regulatory actions and, and I guess one prosecution. It, it says um, one of the recommendations, again we go back here, fourth, agencies lack strong enforcement <coughs> authorities to adequately deter or penalize violators. Do you need more legislative authority? Absolutely. Okay, when will you have your recommendation well, to us? Well, FSIS has, uh, the Department of Agriculture has a bill pending uh -huh. um, that would is give us, with respect to our enforcement duties, I think you're referring in part here to uh, the role that, uh, that FDA plays in the enforcement area, um, uh, but would give us authority, for example, to impose civil penalties, particularly on these repeat violators. There is no question about the fact that in addition to having preventive controls in place that responsible companies would implement to prevent violations, we do need remedies for that unusual case where you have a repeat violator and, and people responsible for large numbers of violations, we do need civil penalty authority. Okay, so we, uh, you have a proposal that is ready to go. We, there is civil penalty authority in the Pathogen Reduction Act, the uh, Pathogen Reduction Legislation we have advanced, um, and that would uh, uh, certainly address the, the part of the enforcement spectrum that, that USDA okay. uh, addresses. Well, we'll work with you. I Please. just want to make sure that we're, you know, these hearings are fine, but if we don't do something to address the problem. Thank you. Let me make another point before I conclude. My intent here isn't to bash industry. In fact, you know, I come from a business background, so mm -hmm. my intent is to have you work with industry because I don't think, I think you could put a million inspectors out there and never uh, accomplish uh, you know, eliminating all the risks, et cetera, that's not going to work. So working with them is, uh, is our intent. But where you, where you have real violations and repeated uh, violators uh, uh, or, or violations from one, one, one source and nothing's been being done about it. I mean, uh, that disserves the companies who are compliant. Exactly. So that's part of our intent, and, uh, and, you know, we'll work with you on that. And if it's other committees of jurisdictions, we need to see that that... Uh, uh, moves forward. I uh, just think my time's run out. I wanted to get into some others, but we'll, maybe I'll get a the chance. The gentleman's to right. His time has expired. Uh, Congressman Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Taylor is the new kid well, in the block. Let me just, before you yield, let me just say to the gentleman, though, if he would like to submit additional questions for the record, feel free to do so. Thank you. And I would hold it open for 10 days. Thank you. Thank you. As the new kid on the block up here, you're, you're correct. The honeymoon is short. Uh, <laughs> not just with my colleagues. Uh, a few, few questions. First, on the restructuring questions, Mr. Schiff asked you a little about the question that I had posed earlier uh, to the GAO representatives. I continue to be a little confused as to the administration's position on restructuring. I think it's something that is appropriate for Congress to consider, particularly in light of the National Performance Review recommendation and now this, what I think is a very strong recommendation from GAO. NPR suggested uh, that FTA was uh, the right place in which uh, these food safety uh, responsibilities would be placed. Uh, GAO seems to be saying that an independent entity, a uh, new department or agency would be appropriate, but it should be health-based. Uh, Mr. Shiv asked you what your opinion was, and after uh, talking about your immediate concerns and the need to bring uh, microbial uh, <coughs> scientific uh, expertise to the department and focus on HACCP, you essentially said you had no opinion, I think. Uh, is your opinion no opinion? And, and second, uh, do you think that it's fair to say that the administration does not have a position on this issue? It's just as far as I know, and I stand to be corrected, the administration has not taken a formal position on any of the bills that have, that have been introduced. The, the National Performance Review, you're familiar with, with the, uh, the analysis and the, and the recommendation contained there. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know what the, the correct ultimate answer is or whether there is a single correct ultimate answer. I, I do think there's some considerations that, re, re, that need to be taken into account um, as Congress considers this question. Um, one, 
uh, obviously the Food Safety Agency, if there were to be one, or the several food safety agencies under the current regime, need to have clear statutory mandates to put public health first, uh, to put food safety and protection of the public that consumes these products first. Uh, the, the thrust of our pathogen reduction legislation is to build into our statutory charge a command to which we can be held accountable that we seriously address microbial pathogens using the best science available to reduce the risk of foodborne illness. Uh, you need a clear statutory charge to do food safety. You also need uh, resources. And, and I think before, frankly, we can decide what the right answer is on this organizational question, Congress and the public have to come to grips with the resource question. Um, I personally don't believe that the problem we have at the federal government is too much resource applied to food safety. There are a lot of issues concerning whether we're making the optimal use of that resource and our shift to the HACCP paradigm uh, among, between both FDA and FSIS reflects the recognition that we need to move to a paradigm that makes better use of existing resources. But, but there are elements of the, of the chain of food production and processing and, and distribution that aren't really addressed at all by the, uh, the federal regulatory system. Uh, transportation, for example. I mean, we, we pay intensive effort to what happens in meat and poultry processing plants. Uh, it, do we really have adequate oversight of what happens when that product goes on the hundreds of thousands of trucks? Now, we don't want an inspector on every truck. Uh, society, I don't think, ought, ought, to be, ought to pay for that. That's not probably the best use of resources. But should there be some oversight of that? How do we deal with the retail level? Historically and currently, uh, the federal government sets standards, provides technical guidance to the states. FDA has the lead on that. We rely on the states to inspect restaurants and, and enforce cooking temperatures for ground beef, for example. Uh, what should be the federal role in overseeing that, if, if it should be different than it is today? And the import situation, I think, is one of our biggest questions. I mean, the public, it's, it's easy to raise questions about imported product. Do we have the right level of inspection oversight there? Yeah. Let me just I don't think the answer to, the, to, to food safety rests in some organizational fix. There's some very basic issues that, that need to be addressed in deciding how we want to do food safety at the federal level. And I think if, if we get into addressing those, then perhaps an organizational solution flows from that. But to think that simply moving pieces around on, on, the, on the organizational chart solve the problem, I, th I think would be a mistake. I guess uh, my reaction would be twofold. One, I think uh, it's not logical to assume that the first step is to get a sense from the public as to the cost. Uh, I think the first step is for the experts, which is you and the FDA and GEO and others, to tell us uh, what those costs would be <coughs> given certain parameters. Second, those issues which you rightly suggested need to be resolved are issues we need to resolve whether we go to uh, one agency or not. I think the overwhelming evidence is that there's uh, currently in inefficiency in the system. There are currently some potential conflicts of interest in the system. And there's uh, currently uh, some duplication of effort. And all those issues you addressed um, uh, do need to be looked at by Congress, but I don't think they should stand in the way of the reorganization. So I'd hope the administration, to summarize, would have a position on the issue would, would come up with a position. I assume it would be consistent with the National Performance Review, which got a lot of press and publicity at the time. Uh, but if it's not the administration's position, I hope they would tell us otherwise. Mr. Chairman, two quick questions in addition. I think they can be answered quickly. Uh, first, with regard to the imports, uh, building on others' questions, I was uh, misinformed, I guess. I thought that you did not test for all chemicals or chemical compounds that are illegal in this country with regard to imported meat. Is that We don't not test true? for all of them. We, okay. we do some limit, we do a certain amount of testing at that reinspection point when meat and poultry is offered for import, but we don't test for all unapproved chemicals okay. here. We, we do rely on and, 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 and see that the foreign system has a, has a mechanism for assuring that product destined for the United States from, say, Australia, uh, is, is complying with our laws, but that's what we rely on. But currently. when you say complying with our laws, are you saying that the Australian authorities do test for the chemicals or chemical compounds that are illegal in this country? They do test they, for those in they, their country? They do test for those. Whether they're illegal or not in, in Australia? They are responsible, and we review their programs to see how well they're carrying out this responsibility. They're responsible for assuring that that product coming out of a plant that is approved for export to the United States is meeting all U.S. regulatory requirements. Okay. Um, interested in that. I, I wonder why then we aren't testing 
here on our shores for those same chemicals and chemical the, compounds. The, the, issue, well, the issue in those countries, I'm sure, is the same here. I mean, what, how much testing is enough, and is testing really the answer? We think that the, the core of the answer is not more testing, but HACCP. And then a, a lesser, or perhaps the, today's level of testing might be adequate to verify HACCP. But okay. we've got to get HACCP in place. Let's talk about HACCP for a second, and then I will defer to the chairman. Uh, I, I agree with you that HACCP seems to make sense. Uh, I'm not sure I un un understand why, we, if we're going to test for anything, why we don't go ahead and test for the chemicals that we are asking other countries to test for. But on HACCP, quickly, uh, what we have to grapple with as a subcommittee and as a Congress is what is the appropriate legislative role. You talked earlier about some statutory guidelines that might be necessary immediately for USDA to carry out uh, its uh, <coughs> microbial uh, pathogen uh, program. You look at the GAO report on page 41, it lists matters for congressional consideration, it suggests that we require you, FSIS, to establish uh, risk-based HACCP systems and so on in industry. Do you need this? It seems to me you're going ahead uh, with a fairly aggressive HACCP program. Uh, are, are you looking we, for statutory we, sort of guidance or affirmation of your programs? Uh, we have not asked for statutory direction to do HACCP. We believe we have the legal authority to do that under our current statute. Um, we also believe we have authority to address the microbial pathogen problem under our current law. We, we believe in that particular area it would be very desirable to have the weight of Congress behind what are some very major changes in how we are going to do business in meat and poultry plants. Uh, if Congress wanted to put its weight behind the HACCP initiative, uh, I certainly have no objection to that either, but we, we feel we have uh, very sufficient legal authority to do it, and we're proceeding this fall on that basis. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. All right, thank you. Um, let me thank you, Mr. Taylor, and your staff for your testimony, and I invite you to participate in the next panel to uh, answer questions from the members regarding the large issues of the federal government system to monitor chemical residues and contaminants in food. However, I understand that you are testifying before another committee and that the time that you have to leave, we understand that, you know, uh, that in order to be at the uh, next uh, uh, engagement. So uh, stay as long as you can. I'll stay we, as long as I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, at this time, um, let me ask the uh, Dr. Sh Fred Shank, Director of the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, come forward, of FDA. Dr. Stephen Sunloaf, Director of the Center for Veterinary Medicine, FDA. Dr. Lynn Goldman, Assistant Administrator for Prevention, Pesticides and Toxics, EPA. May I ask you to You've been sworn in already, you okay, yes. Uh, Dr. Goldman, please. It is the customary of this to the uh, this committee to swear in this witness. You swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Please let the record reflect that they answered in the affirmative. I assume that you would have no other person answer, and if so, I would have to swear them in as well. Okay. Yeah. Raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth. Right. Let the answer in the front of your name, please. I'm Bert Mitchell. Right. Okay. So why don't we begin with you, uh, Dr. Shanky. I guess you've heard the fact that you have five minutes to uh, uh, and to summarize and that your entire statement will be included in the record. Yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members. Also representing FDA with me today is Dr. Stephen Sunloff, the director of the Center for Veterinary Medicine. We appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing and present FDA's views on the regulation of chemical residues in the food supply. As you are aware, the United States food supply is one of the safest and most abundant in the world. FDA is committed to ensuring the safety and to protecting the American consumer from unsafe, adulterated, or misbranded food. The agency strives constantly to improve its existing monitoring programs and enforcement efforts, 
We are concerned that we may be unable to sustain the pesticide and contaminants monitoring program we have in, in place. To this end, we welcome your ongoing interest in this subject. I will briefly describe some of the programs within the Center for the Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. The National Drug Residue Milk Monitoring Program is one of several agency programs to monitor milk and drug residues. <coughs> Data from this program allow FDA, the states, and the dairy industry to assure the public that animal drug use is in compliance with laws and regulations. Violations when, con when detected can be traced back to the offending producer and enforcement activities can be undertaken. In January of this year, the milk program was updated to add analysis performed by certified state laboratories using what we call quick screening test kits that were that were provided by FDA. The updated program results in many more samples being analyzed and was, that was possible before these kits were available. And during the first half of 1994, 2,500 tests were conducted by states with no volatile sta samples found. The National Milk Drug Residue Database is a, very, is a new effort designed to track the amounts and types of drug residues in milk this database includes all of industry and state information from their respective programs. At this time, 48 states and Puerto Rico submit data. The database currently contains results from 3.25 million drug residue samples, and of this number, less than one-tenth of one percent of the tankers of raw uh, milk tested positive for any drug residue. EPA, USDA, and FDA share responsibilities for the federal regulation of pesticides used on food or feed. Our role is monitoring. Over the past five years, FDA has sampled and analyzed over 75,000 separate domestic and import food shipments for a wide variety of pesticide residues. Between 1 and 2 percent of the domestic samples and 2 to 5 percent of the import samples were volatile. Of the volatile samples, none were deemed to represent a safety hazard. We firmly believe that the pesticide residues in the U.S. food supply present very low risk to public health. Finally, we are working closely with EPA and USDA in the development of the new pesticide legislation. This legislation will more effectively regulate pesticides and low levels of carcinogens from pesticides in the food supply, as well as to provide for more efficient monitoring. Under the total diet program, estimated dietary intakes are determined for various substances, including pesticides, toxic metals, and chemical contaminants. The study has shown a dramatic decrease in the exposure to persistent pesticides that have been banned by EPA, such as chloridane, heptachlor, and DDT. It has also shown consistently that the levels of pesticides in the U.S. diets do not present a health risk to Americans. The dietary intake levels of chemicals such as lead have declined markedly since the 1970s. And finally, I want to reiterate a statement that, that I made to this committee in May. FDA believes that it is time to consider improvements in the existing food safety regulatory system and to move forward with the hazard analysis and critical control point approach to food safety. Control of chemical contaminants and drug and pesticide residues will be a part of HACCP. In January of this year, FDA proposed a preventive system for seafood processors in accordance with HACCP principles. We have since taken two additional steps. In August, FDA issued a, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking asking for public comment about whether and how the agency should extend the HACCP principles to all foods. FDA also invited volunteers from the food industry to participate in a pilot study to develop and implement programs based on HACCP principles. The purpose of this pilot program is to obtain first-hand information from FDA to use in implementing this program. We, have also, we are also working very closely with USDA in developing the policies based on HACCP that will result in a uniform and a consistent system for all foods. We appreciate the fact that GAO recognizes the importance of HACCP programs on the continued safety of our food supply. I thank you for the opportunity provided us to participate in this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shank. Dr. Sunloff. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Sunloff, and I'm the director of FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine. Uh, accompanying me today will be Dr. Bert Mitchell, who is director of CVM's Office of Surveillance and Compliance. I assumed this position on June 12, 1994, and so like Mr. Taylor, I'm fairly new to the system. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about my background and the vision that I have for CVM. It was my strong interest in resi residue prevention and my commitment to food safety, which originally attracted me to uh, CVM, which is an organization for which I have a great deal of respect. I'm a veterinarian and I also hold a PhD degree in toxicology. Prior to joining CVM, I spent 14 years on the faculty of the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Florida, where I taught pharmacology, toxicology, and food safety to veterinary students. My research interests focused almost exclusively on drug and chemical residues in animal-derived foods, with a primary emphasis on preventing these residues. Because of my interests, I maintained extensive interactions with USDA, uh, FDA, and to a lesser but significant degree, EPA. I was a primary contributor to several of the livestock quality assurance programs which focus on responsible drug use and residue prevention. I have authored books and numerous scientific papers on drug and chemical residues and was a co-developer of a USDA-sponsored national database on residues of drugs, pesticides, and environmental contaminants. Enough about me. Traditionally, CVM has worked closely with FSIS in establishing residue monitoring, prevention, and enforcement programs. I intend to continue this relationship and encourage even greater cooperation between our two agencies. FDA's testimony uh, emphasizes uh, many of the programs for which CVM and FSIS share responsibility. These include the development of a shared interactive information man management system called the Residue Violation Information System and cooperative programs to monitor the use of animal drugs, identify improper use, and take action to prevent further adulteration of the food supply. The mission of CVM, as I see it, is to ensure the safety of the food supply and to provide for the pharmaceutical needs of animals through the approval of safe and effective animal drugs. My vision for the center is to establish a regulatory environment which encourages animal drug research and development while maintaining our high standards of safety, quality, and effectiveness. There are legitimate drug needs out there uh, which are not being met simply because the cost of the approval process is prohibited, uh, prohibitive. Some of these needs are being met uh, through the sale and use of unapproved drugs. By re-engineering our approval process, we hope to encourage more companies to invest in the approval process rather than to market unapproved drugs. Uh, in this respect, we will continue to increase enforcement action against the illicit sale and the use of unapproved animal drugs in an effort to discourage practices which lead to foodborne residues and which serve as a definite disincentive, as the GAO report points out, for companies to invest in research and development needed to take a drug through the approval process. We will, uh, we will assist in the development of producer quality assurance programs that focus on food safety and, uh, and safe drug use. Uh, as center director, I will encourage the cooperative efforts with USDA to develop educational programs which promote responsible drug use. We will encourage, encourage pre-harvest food safety initiatives which support on-farm HACCP principles. We will continue cooperative efforts with FSIS to develop val and validate newer, more rapid, and less costly analytical methods for detecting drug residues. And finally, we will strive for constant improvement towards our continuing commitment to the safety of the food supply. I appreciate the opportunity to present this testimony, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sunloff for your testimony, uh, Dr. Goldman. Good morning, Chairman Downs and subcommittee members. I'm pleased to appear for you before you today and to contribute to continuing review of federal food safety programs 
As you've requested, I've limited my oral remarks to five minutes to provide a brief overview of EPA's programs to regulate and prevent illegal or unsafe chemical residues and contaminants in the nation's food supply. But as requested by your committee, the written statement includes comments in a number of other areas. Your entire written statement will be included in the record. Great. And I'll be happy to answer questions on any of these areas. EPA's primary responsibility under FIFRA is to ensure that pesticides will not pose any unreasonable adverse effects when used according to label directions. For food use pesticides, EPA's registration decisions are integrally linked to establishment of tolerances or exemptions from tolerance requirements. The pesticide tolerances established by the EPA are enforced by the FDA for most foods and the USDA for meat, poultry, and some egg products. We work closely with the FDA and the USDA, and one of our responsibilities is to make sure that there is a laboratory method to find the residues. We rely on FDA and USDA monitoring data in making our future decisions about a pesticide. Tolerances generally reflect the maximum level of residues we allow to be present on the raw agricultural commodities when they enter commerce or at the farm gate. This level at the farm gate is generally much higher than the level that's actually present on food. We believe that the tolerance process is generally protective of the public health and that it is grounded in traditional risk assessment and risk management practices. However, we are continually looking for ways to improve our process based on evolving science and the need for more clarity and the use of the best available information in assuring food safety. In 1993, the National Academy of Sciences released a report, Pesticides in the Diets of Infants and Children, that criticized our tolerance-setting process as being inadequately protective of children. As a pediatrician, I found their recommendations to be of particular concern. There are two improvements in the data available for setting tolerances that were recommended. One was improved food consumption data for children to focus on age-specific dietary patterns. And the second was improved data on pesticide residues that are actually found on the food to enable EPA to test our own assumptions. We have worked closely with USDA and FDA to carry out these recommendations. Both USDA and HHS are exploring ways to expand their nutrition surveys and to make them compatible to help accomplish these ends. The FDA has led an effort with USDA, EPA, and the National Food Processors Association to establish a uniform pesticide residue database that would be established at the EPA. The plan for this database is now completed, and we must now identify how we're actually going to bring this about. In addition, we are coordinating closely with FDA and USDA on a wide range of issues, particularly those related to analytical chemistry for pesticide residues. As you know, the administration has placed a high priority on revising the nation's <coughs> food safety laws to strengthen them and remedy current inconsistencies. We believe the pesticide legislative proposals address many of the concerns mentioned by GAO in their report. Our proposal would create a single strong health-based standard that would apply to all pesticide residues in food. We are seeking to replace the contradictory pesticide food safety standards in FFDCA with a single health-based standard of a reasonable certainty of no harm, which would end the applicability of the Delaney Clause to pesticide residues. The establishment of tolerances for thousands of fresh fruits and vegetable uses would provide public health protection for all pesticide uses on all foods. FIFRA would continue to involve risk-benefit balancing, however. We also have proposed enhanced enforcement authorities for FDA to recall and embargo violative foods and to level civil penalties. FIFRA record-keeping on pesticide use would also be strengthened. The legislative proposals also include a number of provisions regarding exports. In particular, we are proposing increased technical assistance to strengthen other countries' capacities for regulating pesticides. HACCP systems for imported foods are best achieved when the source country has a strong pesticide regulatory system. We are also strength proposing strengthening um, some of our export provisions for pesticides to ensure that banned pesticides in the U.S. cannot come here on foods. In closing, we're proud of the accomplishments of the federal agencies charged with protecting the nation's food supply. 
At the same time, we acknowledge that improvements can and should be made. We have undertaken a number of administrative initiatives and we have proposed legislative changes to address many of the issues identified by the GAO. We want to work with Congress for enactment of these needed reforms without delay. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you here today and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goldman. And let me just say uh, uh, on behalf of the, the committee, we look forward to working with, with you uh, to improve the situation. Uh, I think it was said early on that uh, when we got involved in this, we're not going to go away. You know, we, we're going to stay right here and we're going to continue to work because I think that we can improve in a lot of areas and I think we must improve in a lot of areas and that's what this committee is saying and this is why we continue to be involved in this. Uh, uh, Dr. Shank, uh, if the system is not broken as you say, how do you explain 110 million boxes of adulterated cereal reaching consumers? How could such gross adulteration of a popular food product go undetected for over a year? How do you explain that if it's not broken? Mr. Chairman, let me uh, talk just a little bit about, uh, about that situation. Um, we, the FDA, uh, identified this illegal pesticide through our normal surveillance uh, sampling. And, and during our normal surveillance sampling, we don't have the priorities on those that we may have on some of the other uh, tests that come into our laboratory. Um, even in view of that, uh, within 30 days, uh, we had uh, uh, identified the source of, this, of, 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 the, of these oats. We had contacted the company, and the company was in a position to take action. It was only four days after, between the time that we had completed our test and when, and when the company responded. So I think that, uh, that uh, fr from, from identification of the problem until, until corrective action was taken, it represents a, a relatively short period of time. You said, why did we not discover this problem during the year that it persisted? Again, I think it's important to recognize the situation that went on and some of the facts that have, that have been mentioned here earlier today. This is not the normal situation of what you would find within, within the food industry of where you have a contractual agreement and, and that agreement is, in, 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 uh, seems to have been violated. Uh, secondly, uh, why didn't FDA uh, catch it earlier? Uh, we don't have the resources to get around to each one of these firms on an annual basis. I, um, uh, the, the, the comfort that we would have is, is that this was not a public health concern, but I would hasten to add that in those pesticide residues or other problems where there are public health concerns, uh, the industry generally pays uh, increased attention under those situations. So you're saying it's not broken, it's just not working. I'm trying to make certain I got clarity here. I'm saying that it's unfortunate that there was a year that it expired uh, between, the, but between when this problem started uh, and, 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 and when, when it was found by the regulatory agency. Um, I can assure you that, uh, from my understanding at least, the system that they have in place today, that HACCP system that for that particular company will, will catch that type of problem in the future. Yeah, Dr. Goldman? Yes, I, I think that it is an example of how a HACCP system could be effective for dealing with pesticide residue issues. Right now, we, have, we rely on our label directions in order to control which pesticides are used on which foods. But if companies were monitoring their own um, processes at critical points and keeping careful records, and, and, and as many companies do actually today, the kind of episode as the episode that happened with Cheerios could be totally prevented. Uh -huh. Do each of your agencies agree that G GAO that the federal approach of relying on end product testing to monitor chemical residues and contaminants in food cannot prevent problems from occurring? I would agree. I think that the, 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 the primary prevention needs to happen at, from the, the very point of use and through the whole process and not just by monitoring at the very end of the process. And as I said, certainly our our registration system is one way that that happens, but obviously I think there needs to also be attention paid to the process throughout the entire um, production process. 
We too would agree with that conclusion, and, and, uh, and as I uh, said in our brief opening remarks, we feel that there's a better, better system, and we're moving in that direction. Right. Let me raise the question with you, Dr. Sunloff. Um, GAO, GAO testified earlier that only one out of about 21,000 animal drug residue violations that USDA referred to FDA over the four-year period resulted in prosecution and there is a problem of repeat offenders. Now, I know you were not the center director during those four years. I will, you came on on June the 12th, 1994. Uh, but in July of this year, Food Chemical News quoted you as saying, and I just want to make sure we got this right, we want to look less like a strong enforcement agency and more like an agency that is responsive to its customers. Were you quoted accurately? And if you were, how could FDA look any less like an enforcement agent given this prosecution record? I mean, just one? Yes. Uh, were you quoted correctly? Yes, I was quoted correctly. I think the context, though, may be a little different than, than what you're perceiving. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned in my testimony, what we're trying to do in order to change the dynamics of the drug residue problem is to, is to encourage companies to come in on the front end to seek approval so that we don't have to take as many enforcement actions on the other end, which is the, uh, the sale of unapproved uh, or unlabeled drugs. Uh, the, uh, the enforcement action that I was talking about was not against the residue violations themselves, but was against the, the, those who would sell or distribute unapproved animal drugs. Uh, the, again, we feel that, that the best way of preventing uh, future residues from occurring and the only way that we're ever going to get a real handle on this system is to make this regulatory process more accessible so that all animals that uh, need drugs will be able to, uh, will be able to go through our approval process uh, and, uh, and will have the benefit of drugs that we will know up front are safe rather than have drugs appear out of need uh, that aren't approved uh, and cause us residue problems. We're much more concerned about the unapproved drugs than we are about the ones that are approved. In other words, what you're saying, you're going to cut down on the amount of letters that you're going to write because we, there's no enforcement. We hope to, to, uh, that, that those number of letters will, will, uh, will, that we will have less letters to write because we'll have less residue violations. We're trying to attract, attack the root cause of residue violations, which in many cases is just the fact that there aren't enough uh, drugs that, to meet the needs out there. And, we, and if there were, we wouldn't be dealing with problems of people using drugs in an irresponsible manner. Right. Uh, thank you very much. At the time I yield to Congressman uh, Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I, I, I uh, have a brief uh, couple of questions, but I can't, can't resist making the observation that I think a major problem in the food safety area has been demonstrated in the last two panels in that in the last two panels we've had representatives testify from three different government agencies with responsibilities in this area, the Food and Drug Administration, the uh, Foods, uh, Service and food Safety Inspection <coughs> Service, the Department of Ag Agriculture, and the Environmental Protection Agency. And I'm not, I'm not uh, in any way critical of the individual witnesses. I'm just trying to point out that I think it's uh, been shown here better than anything we could say that when three agencies divide the responsibilities for a certain goal, that that's an inherent problem. And I think that uh, we should be working towards the goal of one agency with this responsibility. With respect to the situation exi that exists now, I want to ask to the Food and Drug Administration representatives, are there changes in the laws that uh, would uh, improve your ability to enforce uh, current standards? In other words, could, could we help you in the Congress by passing any change in the law that would uh, give you greater ability to, uh, for example, go after repeat offenders who you've, who you've cited by letter over and over again for contamination? Uh, we have, um, we, we, we are paying attention to the recommendations that in the GAO report. There's, there's quite a, a, a number of recommendations there. Uh, for civil penalties and, and what have you. Um, I can state at this point that we unequivocally support the uh, legislative changes that are, that are contained in the pesticide uh, legislation that is, that is before the Congress at this point in time. We also 
um, have a, would, would support uh, streamlining the establishments of, uh, of tolerances under Section 406. In other words, the, uh, something other than the formal rulemaking procedure, which is rather cumbersome at this point. So those are certain areas that we feel would help us from, uh, from, from the foods perspective. Well, I, I think I can speak for all members of the subcommittee that uh, we would welcome specific legislative proposals from all of the agencies that currently share this responsibility uh, to assist you in streamlining the system and making it more effective uh, uh, while we have the present system in place. Uh, I thank the witnesses and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. At this time, I yield to Mr. Sanders. Thank you very much, Sanders. Uh, holding a hearing on a uh, very important topic, and my apologies uh, for being late. Uh, I think, um, as somebody who's been a little bit involved in one aspect of this issue, and that has to do with the approval process for Monsanto's BST, uh, let me say that I think we are being very naive uh, this morning. If anyone thinks that the federal government can stand up the Monsanto chemical company, uh, then we're just kidding ourselves. Uh, Monsanto has put five hormone, which increases milk supply. The result of the increased milk supply will be to drive family farmers off of the land. We already have a surplus of milk. The, all of the evidence indicates that BST makes cows sicker, increases the rate of mastitis, which results in farmers having to use more antibiotics. In fact, it was just the piece, I think, on CBS yesterday, uh, which talked about a farmer in upstate New York having to uh, have his uh, herd slaughtered because they were made sick by that particular uh, product. Nobody wanted this product, really, except Monsanto. Monsanto put $500 million in the FDA caved uh, like a house of cards. In fact, I'm sorry that Mr. Taylor uh, is not here right now. Is he coming back? Do we know where is he going? No, he's, um, he's testified in another hearing. Uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, unfortunately, I uh, did want to speak to him a little bit. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, the absurdity of the situation is that you had Mr. Taylor writing the interim guidance on labeling for, for uh, the FDA. And maybe Dr. Shank can tell us who the former employer of Mr. Taylor was. Do you happen to know? Just out of curiosity. He was with a, with a private law, law firm here, here yeah, in town. That's right. Time. And who did, that private law, who did that private law firm and he in particular represent? Just out of curiosity, might you know that fact? I'm not, I'm not sure how, who all of their clients are, but there, there has... Who uh, was the client? Let, let me say to my colleague that Mr. Taylor did testify earlier, and then, of course, he was just sitting on this panel. So uh, I have, if you have specific questions, what we could do is uh, uh, we could yeah. raise them with him. You know, but well, I, I think just obviously the answer is he worked for, uh, I think, a firm called King & Spaulding, a major law firm, which, and his particular client was Monsanto. Why should we be surprised that he represented Monsanto and now works for the FDA uh, who is presumably uh, trying to regulate uh, Monsanto's BST. Uh, I would just like to ask a couple of questions, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in November 1990, the GAO released a report entitled FDA, quote, FDA surveys not adequate to demonstrate safety of milk, end quote. Uh, this report criticized the FDA's monitoring of chemical residues like antibiotics in milk. Uh, could you please tell me what changes the FDA made to correct the problems discussed in that report of November 1990 and what changes still need to be made? Uh, we've made several changes. Um, we, have, um, we, we have put out more uh, tests to, to look for, for additional drugs. We have implemented new monitoring programs that I mentioned earlier this morning. We now uh, have access to all of the data that are collected by uh, by uh, local local officials, state, and the, as well as the industry themselves, so we have further access to data. Um, we have we have we have enhanced our quality control program of how we do our own testing. So we've taken a number of steps um, to better utilize the constrained resources that we have to deal with this most important issue. How much testing do you actually do? <coughs> I could. The, we, let me provide the numbers for the record because there's a certain level of testing that is associated, that FDA does. There's another level of testing that is, uh, that is done by state officials. It's a, it's a complex program, as you know, with, uh, with oversights, and I'd be glad to provide those numbers to you for the record. I would appreciate that. Uh, the second question that I have is in February 92, 
the GAO released a report entitled, quote, FDA needs stronger controls over the approval process for new animal drugs. That's the title of the report. Uh, that report found that FDA's approval procedures did not detect fraud in the data submitted in support of new animal drug applications. Would you be so kind as to tell us what changes the FDA made to correct those problems discussed in that report and what changes still need to be made? Since that report uh, was issued, we have uh, taken some legal action against some uh, firms and, uh, and individuals who were part of that fraud. Uh, we have held them to uh, very strict um, controls such that we have not approved uh, a drug from the, from the one company that we, we know was uh, guilty of committing fraud, and we are not, that was American Cyanamid. And we, uh, we will not approve a drug uh, for that company until they can uh, uh, provide us with a uh, program uh, that we validate that ensures that the fraud will no longer exist in that company. Let me ask uh, you, any, anyone, uh, Dr. Shanker, Dr. Sunloff, perhaps a question. If right now, uh, as, has, as I understand it occurred, uh, cows get sick from BST, and they are now, as I understand it, the normal procedure is to have them sent off to slaughter. Um, what procedures are currently in place to protect the public from residues of synthetic um, BGH, BST, and other potentially risky substances related to the injections that are in the meat? In the meat. Uh, currently, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't consider it to be BST to be a residue issue. Uh, there is no uh, testing of BST because we have found it not to be unsafe. Uh, that's for BST. Uh, for the uh, drug residues... Well, by the way, you have found that there is no testing for BST. You know that tests could be developed. There is evidence that suggests that they could be developed. We don't believe uh, right now that the, uh, that the tests that could be developed would be sensitive enough to detect the levels that would occur in milk. And we're talking well, about there milk. There are scientists that disagree with you. There may be scientists that disagree with you. Uh, but, but my question was a simple one. My understanding is, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on this, that there are herds that are becoming ill as a result of BST injections. My understanding is that those cows are then taken to slaughter to be uh, made into meat that we eat. What does the FDA do about that? Well, uh, let me just say that, uh, that all, uh, virtually all cows that uh, are dairy cows eventually end up in, in the meat supply. Uh, is there a concern that if cows are slaughtered because they're sick? We, uh, the, uh, I, I don't want to speak for the USDA, but, but they have a testing program that, that uh, looks at animals before they ever enter no, the slaughter. Testing program. If, as I understand is the case, as has been recently reported on national television, a herd was made ill by BST. That is what I understand the case to be. Is that your understanding? Uh, I understand that, that the herd which you're talking about uh, had some increased mastitis problems which resulted in them, in, in the individual dairy farmer, uh, taking a lot of his herd, about 25% of his herd and, and shipping them for slaughter. Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. Now, are you concerned that cows who were made ill by this particular synthetic hormone are now slaughtered and presumably will appear in our hamburgers fairly soon? <laughs> well, let me just tell you that we, uh, we think that the incidence of, uh, of, of problems associated with, with BST use in terms of the types of diseases that we're talking about here are relatively common diseases. Uh, they include mastitis, reproductive disorders. These are things that naturally occur on dairy farms and uh, are one of the causes that cows no longer produce milk. In this case, we have no, uh, we, we are not convinced that even that uh, that the BST that was used in this farm was the cause of the problems associated or that those problems were not manageable. Let me just conclude my remarks, Mr. Chairman. As someone who had followed the, the BST thing for several years, uh, to tell you that um, it was disturbing to see the degree to which the entire process was dominated by Monsanto. It was disturbing to see that at least three high-ranking officials in the Food Administration uh, the formal, former employees of Monsanto in one way or another worked for Monsanto. I think the issue that you're tackling today is a very, very difficult and important issue. And I think the Congress has got to begin to stand up and be vigorous and demand that the United States government and its various representatives 
uh, and agencies protect the interest of ordinary Americans against very, very large companies who could care less about human health uh, and are primarily concerned about their own profit margins. So I, I congratulate you very much, Mr. Chairman, on the hearing. Thank you very much, Congressman Sanders. At this time, I yield to Congressman Micah. Let's see, Mr. Uh, is it, or Dr. Sunlaw, did you say you uh, graduated from the University of Florida? And I graduated from the University of Illinois, but I taught for 14 years at the University of Florida. Oh, you did. Well, anyone who's been associated with, in any way with the University of Florida obviously has impeccable credentials. And <laughs> No need, further need for any uh, questioning. I, I think Mr. I, I the has already the done a Florida. good job on you, and given the gator standing and it happens to be my alma mater, I'll, I'll uh, turn my attention to uh, Dr. Goldman, uh, and I know she's been looking, looking forward to seeing me. <laughs> she may be taking some uh, extracurricular courses there. <laughs> between Where now and January. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one, of the, you know, one of the problems that, that uh, I've seen, again, at being here just 20 months, is uh, that all of our federal agencies do, in fact, have limited resources, and that's taxpayer dollars. And I come from a unique pers perspective. I try to look out for the poor guy that's paying the bill for all of this. And, try to also get the biggest bang for the buck. Some of the evidence we've got before us today and the report seems to indicate that even if we reorganized uh, some of the, the approach to uh, uh, protecting the public uh, as far as monitoring unsafe uh, chemicals in food, that EPA still doesn't have its act together as far as uh, determining what are acceptable levels of risk. And in fact, there are different, uh, it says chemicals posing similar risks may be regulated differently under different laws. So we don't even have our own federal act together as far as what is acceptable levels. What, what's the situation here is, and, and, and you know, the uh, testimony, it's nothing I'm saying. It says EPA may not be able to provide FSIS with uh, the most current information on chemical risks and tolerances. EPA is, is in the process of re-registering re pesticide products but may not complete this task until 2006. And one of my main interests is, again, uh, a risk assessment. Looking, are, are we really approaching this and developing a, uh, a risk assessment and cost-benefit approach that, that prioritizes uh, uh, the, the greatest dangers. Uh, so there's two questions uh, uh, there. One, uh, uh, what about uh, EPA and other agencies' conflict and setting standards? And two, what is EPA uh, doing uh, 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 to resolve some of the problems that are outlined in this report? Yeah, let, me talk, let me talk it through. There, you know, as you know, two statutes that we operate under, FFDCA, um, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And our first line of, um, of activity on a pesticide is a registration under FIFRA. Um, that allows us to review the essential data about not only human health, but also the environment, not only food safety, but also issues such as um, worker safety, the safety of um, those who handle and use the pesticides. Um, and then... Um, at but what about working, uh, what about these conflicts with uh, agencies, that, as pointed out here, that uh, do we need to go back and uh, consolidate authority to set these yeah. standards? Uh, well, I, I think it is important that the, um, the assessment of the risks for food consumption is based on the same data that we use to assess the risks for handling, for using the pesticides around your home, um, for the other uses. Now, under FIFRA, um, we use what's called a risk-benefit approach. We balance between the risks of the pesticides with the benefits to the users, such as the growers, um, of the pesticides. Where we have standards that are at odds are actually within the food legislation 
um, under FFDCA where we have three standards for food safety, three standards for setting a tolerance. And there we do run into situations where for the same pesticide we may have different considerations. Um, if a pesticide is used on a processed food, if it's a carcinogen, it falls under Delaney, which is one standard. If it's used on a fresh fruit and vegetable, it will not fall under Delaney. Um, and that is a contradiction in the way that, that we, um, we assess the public health um, and, and the safety. Now, the re-registration program, um, we would disagree with the GAO that it will not be completed until 2006. What's your deadline? What are, what are you? Now, again, in prioritizing the greatest risks, uh, right. uh, and, and obviously there's some way to at least get uh, some preliminary estimate of what the right. greatest risks are. Uh, what uh, goals or uh, timetable have you set can we expect? If we're able to generate the fees that we need in order to complete the program, we can complete the program by the end of 2001. We have set our top priority on the pesticides that are used in foods. These are our so-called list A pesticides. For those, we have received 8,846 studies. I've been told we've reviewed 6,649 of them, although maybe during this hearing we've reviewed a couple more. It's well, hard you're to also <laughs> accused in this uh, report uh, of not using the latest scientific uh, uh, data available. Uh, how do you respond to that? Um, that what the re-registration process is about is updating the science data. And I think that there has been a problem. I'm, I don't want to mask over that. There has been a problem with the fact that there were decades that went by when this, the, the information that the agency had was not keeping pace with the science, which is why in 1988 it was necessary for Congress to pass the law that required us to do registration. We are now bringing all the pesticides up to date um, with the latest scientific data, and I think that we're going to be able to do that um, as expeditiously as anybody could. Well, uh, I still have uh, problems with, you know, EPA's uh, performance in this area, starting out, and uh, I know my time's going to expire here, with the overall performance of the agency and its uh, willingness to look at some of the uh, risk, cost, benefit approaches that we've talked about. Uh, since this is uh, our last hearing probably before the end of this session, you can take back my message to the administrator that uh, I'm still determined not to see her as a cabinet level or EPA as a cabinet level position until uh, and in fact that uh, the uh, agency uh, does uh, adopt some type of reasonable risk assessment approach in, and if we have to go battle a piece of legislation by piece of legislation which we've done we'll do it in that fashion um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we will also have additional numbers after November uh, in support of uh, the reasonable uh, common sense approach that I think that uh, the uh, Congress is looking forward and the American people, the people that are paying the tab for all this and that we do in fact have limited resources. We can't put an inspector on every truck as we heard uh, with the Department of um, Agriculture and we can't have uh, an inspector in every uh, plant continually. Uh, but we can address the real risk. We can do a better job in cleaning up the environment and also uh, addressing these risks, uh, uh, problems to, to uh, uh, I think, the greatest extent possible, again, with these limited resources. So maybe you'll take that message back and look forward to working with you in the second round uh, next year. Well, I should say on our behalf that we look forward to continuing to work with Congress to improve um, how we achieve public health protection in each and every one of our environmental laws that we carry out at the agency and that we are as interested as you are in achieving the maximum amount of risk to the public in all the actions that we carry out. 
so we're looking forward to working with you all on that. Mr. Chairman, I just ask again unanimous consent that the record be uh, left open for additional questions for this uh, witness. And Without objection. Thank you. We need the record open for 10 days. Uh, let me uh, uh, say to you, first of all, thank you for your, your testimony. And just to sort of um, uh, reiterate something that we said earlier, that uh, you know, some people felt that we would just do one hearing sort of go away. Uh, but I just want to assure you that that's not the case. You know, well, and we want to work with you, but we're going to be on this uh, time and time again because uh, uh, we probably won't do another one this year, but we will probably be right back here <coughs> in the beginning of next year because we're talking about the safety of people. And I think that that's something that we cannot take lightly. I know we talk about not having enough resources, but I think that what we need to do is to make certain that the resources that we do have you know, are being used and used in the most effective way. Uh, the fragmentation is just unbelievable. And I think that we cannot afford the luxury of that. We have to bring all this together and put it in one umbrella and to be able to uh, uh, hold uh, an agency accountable for what needs to be done. And uh, this committee stands ready to work with you. And if there's some things on this side that we need to do, we, st we want to do that. But at the same time, we do not want to be guilty of not doing anything. Uh, I think that is one thing here that I'm uh, the sort of encouraging is the fact that Mr. Taylor is new, the fact that Dr. Goldman, you are sort of new, and the fact that Dr. Sunloff, that you are sort of new. Uh, Dr. Shank, we, we still want to work with you. <laughs> we still want to work with you. Thank you so much. This hearing is concluded. This event was held in late September and was the fourth hearing to examine the Vice President's proposal to restructure federal food safety programs. Today on C-SPAN, a Senate subcommittee hearing on the Postal Service. Postmaster General Marvin Runyon and others are scheduled to testify before Senate Governmental Affairs Subcommittee.